we'll get we'll get started here. First, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan for a couple of housekeeping items. Yeah, thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming back for day two. We had a great day one of the meeting yesterday and hope you had a good uh, evening last night and a good sleep. Um, uh, just uh, a quick housekeeping note. Uh, we uh, received a couple of comments online uh, yesterday that um, uh, uh, folks online uh, would very much appreciate if, if when people in the room are speaking that they could identify themselves uh, because the room camera is hard to pick up people and if the camera is uh, focused on the, um, uh, the podium, for example, um, uh, it's hard to, hard to identify who's speaking. Um, if you're in the room, you can also join the Zoom uh, so that, uh, and have your camera on so that at least, and I'll turn my camera on, <laughs> practice what you say. So, uh, so that at least people can, can, uh, uh, see who's speaking in that sense. Um, uh, if you do join the, the Zoom, uh, in the room, please, uh, disconnect from the room audio, uh, so that we don't get any, oh, sorry, disconnect from the computer audio so that we don't get any feedback. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say. That sounds good. Um, so we're going to jump right in. I don't want to, I, I want to kind of keep us on time and make sure that uh, we've got plenty of uh, time for the, uh, the sessions today. We had a great session yesterday and there are still uh, lots of discussion points. I do want to remind everyone, although this committee doesn't provide a formal written response as a committee through, um, through the National Academy of Science, you're certainly welcome to email each other, uh, uh, scientists between BOEM and, 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 and members on the committee. If you have ideas, you have thoughts, someone presented something that you want to follow up on, or there's more questions, I want to make sure that there's a, a good dialogue happening because that, and that's completely acceptable and encouraged and, and, and everything else. So just uh, as much as possible, this committee is here to, to help and, and, and advise and, uh, and, and we also want to make sure that the questions are, are going both ways, not just the committee asking questions, but please, for, for the BOEM scientists, if you have questions that you, you, you think someone on the committee might answer, don't hesitate or, you know, to, to ask. So with that, um, Jeff, we'll hand it over to you to introduce the first, first sure. session. Thanks, Kevin. Yes, uh, Jeff Reidenauer with BOEM. I'm one of the guilty parties who uh, didn't identify themselves a few times yesterday, so I apologize for that. I'll do a better job today. Uh, so our first uh, discussion is going to be on BOEM's role in coastal resilience. So this is a super exciting topic for us. Um, uh, current sediment requirements uh, will, re will change as optimal resources are depleted. New knowledge and technology advances are uncovered and coastal communities implement their resilience plans. To meet these future challenges, the Marine Minerals Program is taking proactive steps to fulfill its resource and environmental stewardship mission. This stewardship begins with public partnerships and that's something we talked uh, about a lot yesterday. Uh, listening to our stakeholders and providing a national perspective on the cumulative impact of current coastal resilience practices. Uh, at every opportunity, we're, we're trying to raise awareness that offshore sediment is critical to the future viability of current coastal resilience strategies. As sediment availability is more constrained, that there will be uh, environmental trade-offs to consider. And to that end, the, the program has promoted a systems-based regional sediment management approach and future res uh, environmental research to meet these challenges. And so to uh, kick us off this morning, uh, Ashley uh, and uh, Jen, who is going to be calling in uh, remotely, are going to be uh, providing a overview of our role in uh, coastal resilience. Ashley. Thank you, Jeff. Sorry, yeah. Ashley, can you just pause for one second while we try and get a camera on you so that those online can see? <laughs> really not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the back of your head.
Oh, oh there I live goes. in Anchorage. Oop, other way. <laughs> you know, we can go all the way to Paul. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thrilling viewing for those online. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right are we all set please yes all right great well jeff thank you for that introduction um as he's mentioned jen and i are going to talk about the marine minerals program's role in coastal resilience next slide please oh let's get the slides up We'll go ahead and go to slide two, please. Thank you. So first let's talk about just defining resilience. There's a lot of different definitions on this slide and they all have one commonality and that's related to recovering from a disturbance. A coast will be resilient if it's able to withstand sea level rise and it'll also be able to recover quickly from large storms. It's anticipated that these storms may become more frequent larger and more intense in the future. Either perturbation to this particular system, this coastal zone, requires both natural and anthropogenic solutions. So we have our list. We've got you know, various natural structures. We've got things that are related to policy, scenario planning. Um, I think I heard funding, things like that, things that we can do and actions that we can take. So let's compare this list to a list that was assembled from actual coastal resilience plans, from the Nature of Res Conservancy's Coastal Resilience website, and from the US Army Corps Engineering with Nature's website. If we move to the next slide, we've developed a word cloud from those particular, um, we'll call them author author authoritative, and I can't speak this morning, I'll slow down, sources. All right, so I know somebody yelled out nature-based solutions, right? That's the big one, right? That's one of our buzzwords right now. Um, other um, ideas or thoughts in here or solutions revolve around what you can actually do, physical changes. You can relocate, you can armor, you can provide revetments, groins, jetties, some of our hard structures as well. So the one thing I'd like to draw your attention to with this list and some of the lists that we've generated here is that the solutions range from green to gray infrastructure. Green infrastructure is gonna require enhancing an environment, right? Typically that's gonna require sediment. I think we can kind of all agree on that. The gray side is also gonna require sediment to make concrete for asphalt, for roads that building is gonna require a lot of sediment as well. Um, next slide, please. So in this context, I also wanna note that we consider coastal um, restoration, let me slow down, coastal restoration and beach nourishment as a nature-based solution. So we've got a lot of coastline and we've got a lot to implement to make a coast resilient. And this is gonna require a lot of sediment. So this is kind of where we kind of come in for the marine minerals program. So we have this kind of natural connection between the marine minerals and sediment needed for coastal resilience. So the sediment that's gonna be needed are gonna be of various qualities. They're gonna require various specifications, caliber of sediment, and that is all needed to actually improve our coastline. So next slide, please. Would it surprise anyone in this room to know that sediment is the second most commonly used natural resource in the world? This is second only to water. I mean, that's, that's a big statement, right? And we also know that water has its own challenges where there's scarcity. So this is something for us to consider in the long run. If we think about the US and our use of sediment for beach nourishment, 
we've had over a century's worth of historical data of project-centric approaches since 1923. The coast has put over 1.5 billion cubic yards of sediment on its beaches. That's a ton of sediment. You can see in this graph from ECHO et al. 2021 that you can actually plot by decade that use. And the R squared value for our scientists is 0 0.98. It's a huge relationship there, a very strong relationship. If we continue with the current trends of how we're going, that's gonna be a ton of sediment over the next hundred years. That's an exponential growth for the most part. So this is something that kind of compels us to think about sediment maybe in a different way. It's been recognized by the UN and other folks that sand needs to be recognized as a strategic resource that delivers critical ecosystem services. We need to map, monitor, and report sand resources for transparent science-based and data-driven decision-making. There's a really incredible quote within this UN report on sand and sustainability that says the ongoing failure to safeguard sand as a strategic resource is a significant multi-generational crisis that threatens the entire global response to climate change. I think that's really powerful. And that really illustrates the challenge that we're trying to prepare for as our coasts continue to change. So how is Marine Minerals Program responding to this challenge? Next slide, please. The Marine Minerals Program does not take direct action when it comes to coastal resilience. Rather, for coastal resilience, we support as our resource stewardship and environmental stewardship roles and mandates and uh, dictate. As a steward for this research resource, we have a natural, nat national perspective in terms of how those sediments are being used, where the activities are, where the hot spots are across the nation. This gives us a unique perspective and it also allows us to kind of see the writing on the wall. We know that sediment is finite. We know that we are gonna to have to potentially change the way we're doing things in order to continue to meet all these different plans that are being put into place. Over the last hundred years, all actions have been project centric. We may need a different approach over the next hundred. So as stewards of the research resource, we explore for those resources. We facilitate use through our leasing. We also monitor our supply and demand. We monitor the effects of the uh, on the ecosystems and various potential impacts, and we mitigate conflict. So all to unlock those resources. To effectively manage sediment resources and balance our environmental stewardship role over the 95,000 plus miles of US coastline, we need a regional sediment management framework that breaks up the coast into re regional management districts that are denoted on physical boundaries rather than political ones. This supports a science-based approach that facilitates better communication with all stakeholders to have a more equitable say in coastal resilience. But first, we really need to communicate what this could look like. We need a vision to be able to communicate that with our stakeholders, the why we need to do it and what it could look like. Next slide, please. To create this vision, we brought together experts across disciplines, governments, NGOs, and academia with the goal of defining what a collaborative science-based strategic system-based approach could look like for regional sediment management. Now there is a regional sediment management plan that's adhered to by the Army Corps of Engineers. And you'll notice that that one is very restricted to onshore, to the watershed, easily scalable, definitive boundaries. And it's primarily focused onshore, but in their mandate, and the way that they de define RSM, they include the littoral zone, but often that's not incorporated in their RSM activities. So BOM and the Army Corps of Engineers, South Atlantic District Regional Center Management Center for Expertise, that's a mouthful. We co-led this workshop. We chose to have a graphics facilitator at the workshop to help ensure that we could capture this paradigm shift with graphics to make it 
simple to visualize and to actually communicate to maximize look, the likelihood of stakeholder buy-in. Next slide, please. We started the workshop focusing on these six major components to consider. We have temporal scale, spatial scale, geology, geomorphology, sediment transport, and overall sediment management. During that first workshop, we wound up focusing on the latter four components. We recognized that the temporal scale and spatial scale were two that would require far more work than one workshop was gonna actually be able to resolve. And that this is something that we kind of had to put a pin in and revisit in the future. So next I'm gonna to switch to a slide that shows some of the results of this particular workshop. Go ahead, next slide, please. So first, what we did is visualize what a traditional sediment management could look like or does look like right now. What we tried to capture in this particular graphic was that project-centric approach that an individual stretch of beach may be just kind of working in their 50-year plan, developing what they're gonna do in isolation without this broader consideration for the series of cascading effects that their actions would have on the sediment and on the environment. So this graphic is really busy. I know uh, we can provide it to you via PDF after the work, uh, after this particular talk. But what I wanna explain is that this graphic is supposed to represent the status quo for sediment management practices within one embayment that has kind of a boundary or a baffle along the coastal zone on the shelf that kind of restricts sediment movement across that. In constructing the graphic, we identified seven major categories that change the most between the current traditional state and the ideal state. These components include the environmental considerations, resource identification, resource use, use conflict, data, engineering, and planning. If you think about a project-centric ap approach, resource identification is gonna be made from those particular localities in that area that they're primarily interested in economically, something that's really close to shore. They're gonna be doing it in isolation. They may you know, be the have or have nots, right? Those particular coastal communities that could afford to go out outside of the federal government and actually fund it themselves. So you're gonna have all these disparities across the coastline potentially. You're also gonna potentially have a lot of use conflicts. If you don't know where the resources are, it's hard to manage. I know that this is something that's been echoed throughout the days um, for this particular um, period. And we wanted to make this graphic built such a way that a presenter could walk the audience through any one of these seven different categories or components to give the ability to build a story, right? To explain what the sediment management practices are now and how they can change in the future. So we're gonna change slides in just a second, but I, oh, we jumped. Um, that, this is gonna be like, um, you know, the spot the difference exercises that we did as kids. Yeah, this is what this is gonna feel like, right? Um, so I'm gonna say, you know, I definitely sat with my kids in those highlights books, kind of circling the differences. That's just what this is built to do. So we're gonna switch to the next slide. We're gonna move from a project-centric approach to more of a regional approach to sediment management. You'll notice that in this ideal state, we have less conflict. We have more cooperation between beaches shown by like the boats kind of going through and being bringing sediment across multiple beaches. We also have more equity, equity in terms of like the beach width, right? We have similar widths across. We don't have this kind of jagged nature to the coast. We also has, have less constrained movement of sediment. Um, you may or may not have noticed, but some of these dams were removed. Some of the jetties and groins were taken out to allow for the sediment to move a little bit more naturally and to spread um, efficiently. There's all different ways for us to get here, but this is just supposed to, to start the conversation about why it's important to make this change and then offer a couple of solutions for how to get there. But really, this is talking about getting a lot of stakeholders together in one particular location to talk about the challenges, identify the opportunities, and actually implement the plans. So we would like to see a move from project-centric approaches to regional management 
With these new strategies, BOEM can now appropriately align our science with regional need. Next slide, please. So Marine Minerals Program has several different research themes in terms of our resources. Now these themes all kind of work together with one another. So we have a supply and demand theme, and this will kind of tell us where we need to direct spending, highlight need, areas to focus on. The cornerstone of this research is obviously in resource evaluation, right? These can be broken up into geologic framework studies that explain why the resources are found where they are, and resource evaluation studies in terms of sediment budget. Because we're looking at the shallow stratigraphy in the subsurface, we have a direct link between what's going on on the surface and those particular deposits beneath. So as we remove sediment, we also need to kind of monitor how they recover. Now, as we continue to define and identify new resources, that directly impacts our supply, right? So we're, we're seeing this interplay between the two. We also do a lot of research in terms of risk mitigation. So our environmental risk could fall into this. Our multi-use planning risk can also fall into this particular category. And these inform how to manage the resource in the least impactful way. So if we apply mitigations, we may unlock more resources, or we may determine that we can't really mitigate this particular conflict. And we say, we just can't do it here. And those reserves get pulled off the table for use. Now, the last piece that we have is borrow area optimization. This is kind of more of our technological research that we do as we become more efficient, as we find ways to make what was technically unrecoverable resources now recoverable, that influences our, our, the amount of resource that we have, which then affects supply and demand. So this is a great interplay in terms of resource management research themes that we have. Now these themes directly map to the seven different regional sediment management themes that were identified in our workshop. Next slide, please. And we can actually put those different management themes on our puzzle pieces. Next slide, please. Such that the planning identified in the, to change the most between our traditional and ideal state maps right to supply and demand. Our resource identification is very easy to kind of map right to resource evaluation. As I mentioned, risk mitigation encompasses our environmental and use conflicts. Borrow area optimization is really a lot of engineering, but resource use and data, those map to potentially all of them. They inform and then they change based off of what we do here. So all of those seven different categories that we talked about as being most critical and to change the way we do things, map directly to the way MMP directs their, sp their spending. Next slide, please. So you may remember that I kind of identified scale as a big unknown in terms of what we were doing for regional sediment management and how we get there. I'd like to zoom into the Southeast Atlantic where we have a series of coastal compartments that were defined by Hayes and Fitzgerald in 2013. They took the Southeast coast and used wave height and tidal range. So kind of our physical forcings from um, on the coastline and plotted those relative to the resultant um, geomorphology in terms of our barrier island length, number of inlets in a particular location and actually start subdividing the coast. So these are Roman numerals one through six. These are pretty large stretches along the coast, but they have definable characteristics in terms of geologic and oceanographic processes. Now these coastal compartments are akin to maybe the watershed or drainage basin analysis that regional sediment management projects are typically based on onshore. If we take this and we think about the underlying geology in, the, in a very similar area, so these are denoted with A through D and they're representative cross sections, the right hand side um, that's from the near shore area using chirp seismic, um, we can see that there's actually a big difference in terms of the geology as well and the sediment availability from A to D. So in the North, in Northern South Carolina, we have the Cretaceous cropping out near the seafloor 
and very little quaternary sediment being preserved. It's very patchwork. We're sitting up atop the Carolina platform, very close to the Cape Fear Arch in this particular location. So we have an explanation for why sediments are very restricted in this particular area. As we move to the south, as we go towards southern central Georgia, we get into the Georgia embayment. We have increased accommodation. We actually have quaternary sediments that are being preserved almost as complete sequences or Paris sequences. And here you can kind of see that we would potentially have a very different strategy for looking for sand, um, data collection strategy as well, where maybe we can use our seismic a little bit more in the south because we have these continuous units that we can start being predict predictive of, use our secret stratigraphic principles. Whereas in the north with this patchwork series of incisions and, and surface sands, it's a lot more difficult. So maybe we gotta be a little bit more data heavy in the north. So this denotes kind of different challenges in different coastal compartments from A to D. Another really awesome thing that we have using coastal compartments is the ability to actually transfer learnings. So Hayes and Fitzgerald denoted that coastal compartment two actually has a lot of similarities to coastal compartment six. And in terms of what we do, we actually see a fair amount of leasing in both of those compartments as well. So it's something else to kind of consider as we're moving on. Now, on top of this is also just sediment delivery to the system, to the near shore. And we actually have um, discharge denoted by different Piedmont and coastal plain rivers on land here to kind of tie in that sediment budget piece. Discharge is standing in for sediment delivery to the coastline. And that is also another piece for us to consider when we're denoting what our different coastal compartments should be. Next slide, please. So the Army Corps of Engineers published their version of regional and local scales from the perspective of physical processes in space and time. And this is shown in the graph on the right. However, there is no nationwide characterization along the coast. We need to marry the onshore approach, this watership scale, to the offshore. Overlaid on this discussion of the appropri appropriateness of scale determined by physical processes is the question of societal considerations. Divisions of the coast exist from political boundaries, our states, counties, localities, our Army Corps districts and divisions, or our cultural boundaries in terms of indigenous current or ancestral lands. So how can we break up the coast to ensure an effective representation in addition to tying in the physical processes? Now, adaptation of this regional management approach requires buy-in from all stakeholders on all levels. One of the greatest impediments we see to this endeavor is overcoming the sand plenty perception problem. When people go to the beach, they see sand. When repairs are necessary, sand can be found. A common misconception is that sand can be found in abundance on the seafloor, stretching out as a continuation of the beach for miles, right? This goes hand in hand with the challenges facing coastal resilience adaptation. When a threat to a coast is incremental with like sea level rise and stretched out beyond normal human observation scales, it is hard to communicate the need for transformative rather than incremental change okay, as identified from the National Climate Assessment especially as human consumption of sediment far outpaces natural timescales of creation. Next slide, please. So this is gonna kind of sum up this conceptual discussion about regional sediment management and BOEM's role in coastal resilience. I wanna highlight that what we're proposing here for regional sediment management is very similar and complements really well to ecosystem-based management that was discussed before. They both inherently need a thorough understanding of physical processes. There's also a linkage between site characterization and regional evaluations. So there's a lot of work that can be done to really marry these two. The next steps that we have planned for this particular effort for RSM visioning is a phase two. Right now we're planning to visualize each of the seven different regional sediment management themes that change the most, define roles and responsibilities for key stakeholders within a particular coastal compartment, 
and define strategies and tactics to move forward. So in the next set, set of slides, we're gonna talk about current and future research in terms of MMP investments. But while we're doing that, I'd like you guys to consider recommendations for how to facilitate stakeholder buy-in for this particular endeavor, and also get information from you in terms of how to determine the best scales for the most effective management, both spatially and temporally in the future. Next slide, please. Next slide. So first I wanna talk about our borrow area and resource classification scheme that we're proposing. We have a contract right now to actually do this. One element that restricts resource management is a lack of borrow area or resource classification schemes. In the image on the right, we have a map developed by Pendleton et al. in 2017. In this map, we have the Delmarva. We have a series of shore oblique sand ridges denoted by the highs. They all kind of are trending northeast, southwest for the most part. They've also been defined into various different ridge fields. And those are denoted by the different circles that you have. Next slide, please. Overlaid on these particular ridge fields, which were defined by shape, orientation, migration patterns, which were determined from the illustration on the right, we can put the borrow areas, actual leased borrow areas that were used for different beach nourishment projects across this region. You'll notice that we've got three different borrow areas and they're in three different ridge fields. So now we have questions. Were all these borrow areas equally successful? Were they all treated similarly when it came to environmental impact analyses? Were risks identified pre-construction actually realized in these borrow areas? And what learnings or expectations can we transfer from one area to the next? Sounds kind of similar to the ecosystem-based management, right? So we need a classification scheme or a tool to address these questions. If we have a common language, a unified vocabulary of offshore resources, we can communicate re results effectively. As we document used borrow areas where we have a wealth of data and performance indicators, we can ensure that learnings are actually passed from one location and event to the next, and that these learnings are not actually lost. We can also build a framework that extends the parameters from our knowns, our borrow areas where we have the most information to our unknowns, our potential sand resources in that particular ridge field or beyond. We can also develop an analog database from this information. Say we have shore oblique sand ridges in another location, but that's saying that this is gonna be a resource type, but just kind of go with me here. We can then take our range of, of expectations and apply those, reducing uncertainty as we continue to work. If this endeavor appears successful, we will exercise an option to further define risk factors for each borrow area type or sand resource type. Risk could be internal to the particular resource, resource in terms of shell content, MEC, color, or external in terms of EFH, proximity to hard bottom, et cetera. This approach facilitates regional trade-off analysis between several different resources. So in all, this particular project will address resource identification, use conflict, and environmental RSM themes that were identified in our visioning exercise and will also help move MMP towards reserves management. Next slide, please. The last case um, study or investment that I would like to talk about is the, from the Mid-Atlantic. And this is one that kind of keeps coming up, right? We've got a lot of activity in the Mid-Atlantic in terms of our wind, and we've got a lot of potential conflict with MMP sand resources as well. So MMP has had multiple stakeholders requesting support for sand resource identification in light of the current need, projected need, and spatial planning challenges. We have set up a contract to collect geophysical and geological data over a pretty wide area. The study area goes from False Cape, Virginia, north to Montauk Point, New York. The offshore extent, we incorporate it from the federal state boundary all the way out to 24 nautical miles. This includes several of the actual lease areas for wind as shown by the polygons on the map. Now we did this 
because there's a lot of information that we're going to be able to extract from these different regions. There is a wealth of data in the Mid-Atlantic. If you look at MMIS, there is a ton of data, but not all data is created equally, right, in terms of what you could use it for. How can we take this really broad area with really great coverage in terms of data and actually determine focus areas that will give us the maximum value for our limited line miles and cores that we have to such a broad area? Next slide, please. So we are gonna overlay two different geospatial approaches and marry that with stakeholder input. The first approach is to look at data. So we have a wealth of data. Um, we have this product here that was de developed a few years ago um, that looks at data density and actually just breaks up our geophysical lines by OCS block and gives us relative abundance. And then overlaid on that is an abundance of geological data, so cores and grabs. This is a way for us to kind of visualize with simplicity, so again, another theme, um, where we actually have a high concentration and should have the best understanding in terms of sand resources in an area. These are using the same type of data that we use in order to define resources. But of course, some of these data are really old. Some of these data we can't find anymore. Some of these data hint at just geologic framework rather than help us to actually define a sand resource. So now we need to go through and assess quality. And this particular contract, they're gonna go through and actually define out quality, similar to if you were going to create a geomodel or a, reservoir or a geological model into a reservoir model, where you kind of get your uncertainties bound and you understand the limits of your data, how far you can kind of push things. We're gonna develop that first pass map on data quality. We are gonna overlay that with an avoidance map. Now the Gulf of Mexico had a contract a few years back with Stradley and they produced this really awesome avoidance map that incorporates cables and pipelines to kind of help identify high conflict areas, areas that you can kind of focus on to deconflict. But this will help us high grade areas that have a data need, a data gap, a knowledge gap with accessible resources if they exist, which is also a big if. These two products overlaid on one another, I think will be very powerful uh, for us. And we will then integrate these products with what our stakeholders are saying in terms of the needs, what they're seeing for what they need for their various projects over the next 50, 100 years. So the new data collected in this TO or this task order will combine resource identification from this RSM themes, use conflict and our data themes. So next, Jen will take over and focus on the current and future investments that address the environmental theme for RSM with respect to coastal resilience. Next slide, please. Great, thanks, Ashley. Can everybody hear me okay? Ashley, can you give me a thumbs up? You walked away. I can only see Ashley right now, sorry. Thirsty. You can hear me, okay, thanks. <laughs> sorry about that, put you on the spot there. All right, let me change my view real quick so I can see. Okay, so thanks everybody. Sorry, I cannot be there in person today to talk to you about this, but um, we're gonna continue a little bit on some of the themes yesterday that Dina and Anna touched on about our environmental studies. We wanted to give you some examples where they tie in directly to some of the regional sediment management that Ashley explained. Um, Dina and Anna, talk, Anna talked a lot about habitat value. They talked about developing mitigation, um, multi-use conflicts. All of that is relevant in our first example that we're gonna talk about here. And as they mentioned, our studies are meant to tie this regional sediment management with ecosystem-based management together by focusing on not only resource need, but also the biological, the ecological, or other resource areas that are protect, potentially affected by our um, offshore sand use. And this includes things like essential fish habitat, which we'll talk about, um, and other resources that we focus on so that we can design more effective mitigation measures to avoid, uh, minimize, or eliminate adverse environmental impacts. Next slide, please. So here's a very project specific, um, like a regional, um, a less than a regional scale, a more 
um, on the spatial scale, it's much more focused um, environmental study that were that was initiated in um, the fall of 2022, runs through the fall of 2026. And it's focused on frying pan shoals. Frying pan shoals falls within that uh, coastal compartment too that Ashley spoke about, which is a very sand limited area. And this is an example of a ecosystem based management study that we developed um, and it's off of Southeastern North Carolina. This is a cooperative agreement with UNC Wilmington, and we are attempting to characterize this important sand resource. We know that it's designated as an essential fish habitat, and there are a lot of concerns both federally and the state, uh, locally, at the federal, state, and local level from officials about impacting um, this sand shoal. <clears throat> Um, in this project, we're seeking to understand the environmental and then biological systems along this Cape Associated Shoal that we are believe will be a target for future renourishment projects. To address these questions we have, we're focusing on data gaps for habitat and spatial distribution of key species, benthic communities, sediment transport pathways, and rates. Um, the Cape Fear River, which you can see is adjacent, directly adjacent to the shoal, um, plays a, a major influence on the shoal itself. So we want to get a better understanding of what that influence is, both physically and biologically. And then we ultimately want to provide actionable data and modeling so that we can examine impacts, potential impacts for the shoal wh when or if we get a request to utilize the shoal to mitigate risks and to enable long-term planning. Um, I also want to mention that this shoal is directly adjacent to the Long Bay, the Carolina Long Bay wind energy area. So a lot of the research from this shoal, um, from this study, will also be relevant to the use of that area and the uh, placement, the potential placement of any transmission corridors. Um, I should mention as well that there is a similar study in the Gulf of Mexico that um, is at Ship Shoal. It's another. Um, kind of ecosystem-based study that I'm sure our Gulf of Mexico partners would be happy to speak to as well, um, you know, later at a later time, if you'd be interested in that. <clears throat> Next slide, please. All right, so tying back to um, coastal resilience and climate change, we wanted to bring up a project. So the, exist the prior slide was a project that's ongoing. This is a project that, um, is a study profile on the next um, studies uh, studies development plan, and it's a existing project emissions calculator. So we're tying this into our consideration of climate change when we do our analysis of these projects. Um, as you know, as um, Victoria pointed out, the umbrella of NEPA of NEPA that we evaluate uh, potential impacts under this mandate and. That includes greenhouse gas and climate change effects um, with there's recent CEQ guidance that requires the disclosure of these greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. This existing, this calculator was already in existence. Um, Jeff Weichel developed it, I want to say 10 years ago, maybe not quite that long. And we have been utilizing it in our NEPA analyses. And it's also utilized by the Army Corps of Engineers. So as we're we typically a cooperate agency with them as they're the lead agency, we do this analysis and provide it with them to them with some text for our NEPA documents. And the calculator itself has an output. It considers um, operational factors, activity profiles, loading factors, and emission factors for all different equipment types. You essentially pick the dredge type, you insert the cubic yards that you're planning to dredge or that was requested in a lease request. And then you also enter some other things such as um, distance from shore for the borrow area. And you get, as you can see on the bottom right, an output of emissions um, for various um, uh, greenhouse gases and other um, emissions that we have for different operational like equipment. So whether it's a crew boat or a dredge itself or a um, onshore, excavator, you get an emissions output for that. Um, and this is great. It's just that it's a little bit outdated. Um, a lot of the loading factors, emission factors need to be updated. Um, we also have um, considered adding, well, methane would definitely be an, an addition. 
there are some gases that other additional gases that we've considered add, adding um, to the calculator as well. And again, we're still working on putting this, uh, adding this to the next year's studies development plan. Um, so while we're you know, increasingly interested in how our program can respond to sea level rise and increased storm changes. This is kind of the other side. We're also also need to understand how our activities could potentially add to that climate change as well. Next slide. We also wanted to propose to you some future research considerations that Dina and I have been discussing. Uh, for a future year's study development plans. Um, as Bill mentioned, a top priority for BOEM is to protect ecosystems in the context of climate change. And as it, relation, as it relates to dredging, we have some additional questions regarding the intersection between dredging impacts and climate change um, that, we may, that we presently don't have a lot of answers to. So these are kind of on two different temporal scales, I would say the first and the second bullet. But the first one is looking at potential habitat shifts that we know, such as uh, maybe fish or shark, fish or sharks, habitat shifts that we know may be occurring uh, within a range of habitats um, due to climate change. And then looking at how we are analyzing our impacts, our potential impacts to habitat and not maybe not considering in light of that, um, the habitat shifts um, what, how, how much greater our impacts may, may be. So for example, say offshore, we're considering, you know, impacts to a bar, we're saying we're considering impacts to a borrow area offshore, but not giving the consideration of the fact that some of that habitat, um, some of those species that are utilizing that habitat may actually be moving more onshore. And while we may have ample offshore habitat, the onshore habitat may, or closer to shore, not onshore, but closer to shore, um, the near shore habitat may have already been impacted by previous dredging. And we haven't really considered that as sea level rises that habitats will be moving around and how is that impacted by our activities. <clears throat> the second concept, concept is more of a cumulative impacts consideration. So how, uh, what's the intersection of dredging impacts, changes to habitat from climate change, and cumulative impacts from also other activities that may be impacting similar habitat, <clears throat> such as something for fisheries or sea turtles. Next slide, please. So this is a, a summary of what we've been talking to you about over the last hour, 50 minutes or so. Um, these are long-term considerations for our program. We as mentioned in multiple um, presentations, aim to proactively position ourselves to support coastal resi resilience. Um, we ideally will then also maintain a balance of resource and environmental stewardship in an increasingly crowded ocean. I know that's been echoed multiple times as well. Um, our key research themes to be addressed are continuing to support reconnaissance level data collection efforts, and prioritize areas where we have demand, which out, is outpacing current supp supply. We we'll promote research and trade-off analyses that consider the range of ocean uses. Again, so um, when it comes to, for example, something like frying pan shoals, um, there's a trade-off there between essential fish habitat and need for coastal resilience, and which um, doing a trade-off analysis on, on on those this, those different trade-offs and considering which one may have more uh, need or value. We, as we've echoed many times, um, are partnering with state and federal agencies. We're working to unravel the state, the sediment transport processes from onshore to offshore and undertaking a coastal state supply and demand study. And we're also, as I just mentioned, looking at future environmental studies that focus on climate change and our intersection with dredging. And the last slide, please, for our presentation is um, a summary of the questions that Ashley had previously posed for your input, and also the questions that I posed about regarding climate change and dredging. Um, and we'd love to have your input or have any questions that Ashley and I could answer for you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you to Ashley and to 
and Jennifer, uh, it's a lot of uh, information and very, very thought provoking. So um, would, would anyone in the committee like to start to take a, take a crack at some of these questions? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, one thing I noticed is that there isn't a data layer for biodiversity or biological richness. Um, to some extent, that overlaps with the central fish habitat, but not completely. They're often orthogonal. Um, is that just not practical, or, or why don't why don't we see it there? That is that aimed at me? I don't, <laughs> I don't know much about the data layers and why their presence or absence. So I don't know if I'd be very helpful with that one. Um, Jen, this is Dina. I'll, I'll try. Thanks, to Dina. I appreciate it. Dina Hansen with Foam. Um, I think a lot of times we look to external um, kind of data portals that might have mm -hmm. them already um, kind of compiled. So instead of recreating kind of our own, it would be beneficial, I think, to adapt it with, you know, these layers, you know, the data layers that BOEM is generating. Um, but I know, you know, for a lot of our analyses, we will kind of go to like the Northeast Ocean data portal or um, kind of places where this information already exists. Um, but regionally that varies, right? Like the data richness in this US Southeast versus the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, um, you kind of just have to work with work what's with available. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that helps, thanks. I, I have a comment on, on the, uh, the, the kind of the last, the three points, um, because you're, 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 looking at, you're looking at climate change uh, you know, effects of climate change that could be impacted by dredging? Um, are there cumulative effects? And how to determine the scale, but that scale must be changed, right? With, with, with the frequency of increased storms and, and the power of these storms, you're, it, must be a, it must be a moving bar, right? No pun intended there, but yeah. But yeah, so it's hard to get your mind around, I would think, yeah. And there are times where we just have, you know, years with so many storms that we have frequent dredge events and sometimes years where we just don't have that many dredge events. So I guess that maybe speaks to your moving bar, but um, we expect that the dredge events overall on average will probably likely are likely to increase in the future, of course, as you saw from that exponential um, graph from Elko 2021 that Ashley presented or presented. And I'd, I'd also add that we consider potentially just bracketing the ranges of scales that we should be looking at for regional versus site specific so that we can actually start delineating, okay, this is going to be the regional scale. Maybe sometimes it overlaps with a site scale if there's a particular site that's particularly big and massive. But, you know, how do you break up what you're looking at temporally and spatially to be effective, to not completely overlap? You know, you may need complete overlap spatially so that you actually participate in two different coastal compartments to actually fully realize the impacts, the far field effects of what's going on in terms of res uh, resource as well. So it, it is a really interesting question and we're just trying to figure out ways to get there, ways to determine how to bracket those scales. Yeah, and I think that definitely ties back to some of the discussion with Anandina yesterday because from a NEPA perspective, we're really looking at the scale of either you know a one-time event, which isn't the most favorable, but a multiple of time event in a borough area, right? So we're looking at the environmental impacts within a borough area, and that's a very small scale. If you look at Frying Pan Shoals, even Frying Pan Shoals is a very small regional area, but it, a borough area would be just a subset of that. And so you, what you're doing is like, there are two different scales. The, the scale for the sediment management is even broader than an environmental analysis scale. So I think that was part of the question. It was like, um, you know, we've been focusing essentially on environmental questions are on very focused kind of smaller borrow areas scales where maybe we need to broaden that and consider larger areas. And how, how do you do that? And at what time temporal scale do we do that on? Because we typically consider environmental impacts on the scale driven by the Army Corps, which is about 50, 50 years. But if you're thinking about climate change, 
you're probably going to need to think maybe broader than that just to make sure that you encompass like an understanding of habitat shifts and and what we're going to see on a longer scale so it's there's a lot of temporal and spatial questions and we do things a little bit differently sometimes under NEPA than we would do under regional sediment management which makes it even more confusing um Barton's got his hand up I don't know anybody Hey, yes, I just wanted to uh, mention the question about biodiversity. Uh, the study that uh, Jen had mentioned earlier in the uh, chip show area, we are looking at uh, biodiversity, uh, number of species, even as Shannon's and so forth. Uh, in fact, Dina showed some uh, results from that study yesterday uh, <clears throat> where the uh, you know, the reference areas and the dredged areas are, are showing some differences and uh, we're monitoring that. So I just wanted to let you know that a lot of our studies do uh, conduct uh, biodiversity uh, evaluations. So I just want to mention that. Right. Thank you. Um, to, uh, I'll just finish up one thing before I uh, go and then Jack and, and, and Lauren. Um, one of the so, so I do, I work a lot with, you know, com community um, structure and community shift. And, and in that, I, I, I was always kind of st um, struck with, and it was, it dates back to pa Robert Payne and some of these, these guys that were talking about, um, you know, about regime shifts. And I think there's also actually a little uh, chaos theory in there, but you know, if you have a pendulum in a, in a, in a, in a grandfather clock and you, you hit that clock once, the pendulum will will change its it, its swing and then go back to the way it was. But if you hit it uh, multiple times, it'll it'll actually change and you'll get a different you'll get a different swing. And I wonder if that's a, a little bit of what you're you're trying to grapple with with a spatial and temporal scales. When does it when does when uh, because of the, the frequency of these storms and the amount of change? When does it when does it become a new paradigm? And, um, and, and then you have to, instead of trying to re rebuild or maintain what you have, you have to look at a creation of something, something new. So that's, it was just a, a thought I had with it. Uh, Jack. Sorry. I'm interested a little bit how you um, interact with other groups working on this. So I'm familiar with the NSF Coastal Ocean and People, or Coasts and People Initiative. Lots of intensive mapping of sediment, say in the Pacific Northwest, but I'm sure there's others around the nation. So that's an NSF effort. And then we just saw the NOAA IRA call for lots of coastal resilience work. How do you interact with those groups? So I would say a lot of what we're doing is kind of boots on the ground, right? Um, we are interacting with local coastal communities. They're kind of helping us point to what their activities are. Um, we have been interacting with the Committee for Marine Transportation Systems um, that has a big interagency group associated with it as well. And we've kind of talked to them about, you know, they're, they're assembling a bunch of coastal resilience plans to help us kind of start generating that list as well to start thinking about you know where those needs are um, you know we have lots of partnerships across the federal and state governments so it's really just us all reaching out we don't have anything formalized but that's potentially where we need to go um, is that bomb's role or is that something where we need to kind of raise the idea and see who may kind of step into this space is a big question right because it's not necessarily i mean we're, we're here saying hey there's potentially a sediment problem um, but this is a larger problem for the coastal communities, you know, and we're just a participant. But generally, gen generally in the Atlantic, um, through the reaching out that Ashley mentioned, we have an understanding of what other agencies are working on to some extent. Sometimes we don't, but <laughs> I would say there are certain areas where we have a lot of um, detailed coordination. And certainly if um, renewable energy is coordinating with NOAA on mapping, they will pull us in as well. So that's been a real help, I think, particularly in areas like the Long Carolina Long Bay, where we know NOAA's doing some surveys we found out about, we're doing surveys, the developers are doing surveys, and we've all gotten together to look at survey plans and discuss um, who's doing what and how they might intersect with one another. I see Brian's hand up. I don't know if there's other people in the room. 
Yeah, hey, um, this is Brian Cameron from Bowman, the Marine Minerals Program of the Gulf. Um, we also do a lot of work with the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Um, that, for those of you who are not um, aware, it's a group similar to Marco up on the Mid Atlantic. Um, they do a lot of work, collaboration of federal, state agencies, as well as local communities, um, academia, and everybody else um, in the public. And, you know, it, it's a great effort to be able to combine all that information and data knowledge. Um, as a matter of fact, Ruth, who's sitting in the room right now, um, I, I was just sitting with her two months ago at the Gulf of Mexico um, conference, um, talking about some of this exact stuff. So um, we are doing a lot of it in the Gulf as well. Do a lot of work with the Corps of Engineers to try to see what we can do to work together with them and help support their efforts as well. Hello. Hi, this is Lori Suma. Thanks very much for the presentation. I think this is a I think it's all really important work. Um, and you all may have said this over the last day or two and I missed it, but are we good at quantifying the rate of, um, of resource depletion? Do we know, you know, from one place to another, exactly what, what the changes in rates of depletion are? which might help engage stakeholders if there's really near-term depletion. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And we know what we know, and we know that there's a lot of unknowns. So we do not have a good grasp on the actual baseline, how much sediment's available. So we can't give this overall broad number. And then you start slicing and dicing that in terms of what's suitable for beach nourishment, what's suitable for back barrier nourishment, what's suitable for aggregates. We aren't there yet. You know, we're at the very beginning in terms of resource delineation and definition. So I think we know what we have and we know how fast we're using that, but we're constantly adding to that inventory and removing. It's just such a moving target. In, in defining your, your, this is Kevin, sorry. In defining your scales, um, how is how is technology uh, playing in with that? And for, what, what I mean by that, I mean you, you gave a presentation of the technology that's that's developed now, but usually your your spatial and temporal scales shift as as technology improves. And so, are you seeing any improvements coming down the pipe that are are, are going to kind of help you plan it out? I'm going to say, I don't know. Um, I can open that up to others in the room. Dina. Um, I, I'd say from the ecological perspective, um, we are, are trying to capitalize on new technology to, um, so sort of on that larger, broader scale using models, um, things like that mapping, that kind of thing. And then on smaller scales, um, trying to use the um, kind of fine scale tagging, um, very focused sampling methods. So I think for the kind of biological side of it, we are, you know, trying to use as much technology as we can as we develop our studies. Um, and this morning we were talking about sort of ap applying the tried and true methods while also adding this new technology so that you have a way to um, almost gut check that your new technology is matching what you're finding with your kind of older standard methods. Um, so that's more on the ecology front. But one thing that I thought about when you were talking about, maybe the committee has thoughts on that RSM scale, how does that match or mismatch the ecological scale? I know yesterday we talked about physical and biological kind of coupling. Um, and so we know that the physical environment can help determine the biological environment, um, but there are certainly mismatches based on life history and what kind of organisms might also be there. So I don't know if like, you know, for that scale question, we almost have to think of it in two different ways. What's what's physically meaningful, what's ecologically meaningful, and how do those um, sync up? So I don't know if the committee has kind of thoughts on the that kind of duality of scale as, as well. Uh, I, I think from my knowledge of it, you guys are doing the best possible job of jackknifing what you know from one place to others, but I, I still wonder how exposed we are in terms of things like endangered species like piping plover or least tern, which are in the area and have a very indirect 
but possibly very important uh, attachment to what's going on. We, we definitely, uh, this is Dina Hansen again, and, and Jen's online, she can certainly weigh in, as well as our other environmental folks. When we do consultation um, with NOAA fisheries for endangered species, um, including those onshore animals that may not be directly in BOEM's jurisdiction, they are included in that um, assessment as far as, you know, we, we estimate our impacts and then NOAA responds with whether they agree, disagree, and then they provide those mitigation measures, um, which sometimes they use BOEM science to um, develop. And, and so we're always kind of open to those partnerships to, you know, say we have new, there's a new data gap, you know, loggerhead sea turtles are being found farther north. So there's a whole new, you know, kind of frontier there that we can explore. So we, that's sort of where we kind of get those study ideas um, back and forth with our resource management agencies, including onshore. And James? Yeah. So switching a little bit to the, the atmospheric side of things, the you talked about looking at this, looking at the emissions in terms of climate change. Have, I would say maybe also consider air quality as far as whether you're in non-attainment or near non-attainment areas as the, the federal standards get tighter and tighter. Emissions are gonna be more and more important. And for a lot of countries that are non-attainment or near non-attainment, the scenarios, the, the conditions that lead to some of the, the more intense air pollution days tend to have these land sea breeze recirculation events. It's not just on like the Gulf Coast, but it's also even in, I think Chicago with the Great Lakes has a very similar situation where um, things are, are cooking over the water and coming in. So if you're having these emissions out over the water, they may have a, Climate change, I think of as, as a longer term, but there's also a more acute kind of short term impact on coastal communities. So I'd say maybe consider some of that as well uh, with this. And, and with the emissions estimates that you have, I, I do think that they probably need to be updated. I was happy to hear that that's part of the plan. I was curious if, if that's gonna be mostly based on, on modeling or if there's gonna be some empirical Studies. I know Texas is beginning to look at commercial marine emissions um, as uh, a, a needed area um, as for, for improving that significantly. I, I can address that. Um, sorry, I got muted. Um, we do actually, I didn't put it in here, but we do uh, use the calculator for our air quality analyses. Um, and Historically, for the Atlantic, I won't speak for the Gulf, but historically in the Atlantic, our projects have been adjacent to attainment areas. Um, we have had maybe one or two, and Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff Weichel, um, adjacent to non-attainment areas. It might be one in New Jersey. Um, when we have projects in New Jersey, it becomes more relevant <clears throat> for con concern. Um, but yes, we do consider that, and that is something that we do in our NEPA analyses. Um, for our air quality determination. Um, I feel like there was a second part of your question that I was gonna address, but I can't remember what it was at this point. Uh, look, uh, the, the methodology for updating the emission estimates. This is Jeff Weichel from Boom. I'll jump in on that. So um, yeah, the Jones Act uh, limits the uh, uh, dredge fleet to basically, uh, I don't know, there's about 12 dredge plants that operate on the OCS effectively. And uh, so we can go in very specifically and get information about the tiering of, of the engines and the propulsion systems. And sort of, um, we go into a process then that's peer review with EPA and uh, get the best information about emission factors associated with that, that engine technology and its generation. Um, and, and then on top of that, um, we get some operational data from from the dredge plants themselves of how they're um, consuming fuel, uh, the fuel types, and get some information about the loading factors that allow us to get a reasonably good estimate of um, of what the uh, criteria pollutants will be. And in areas like non-attainment, then we work closely with EPA and go through their general conformity process to figure out what offsets uh, may be necessary if you're in an, an attainment zone and uh, you're in excess of the uh, permissible thresholds. 
And, and we do have done some air mod modeling, looking at uh, shoreline fumigation in a couple in a couple of project areas where there are no, noticeable coastal breezes that tend to have a onshore, uh, excuse me, an offshore to onshore flux. John. Hi, uh, John Jensen. Um, shifting the questions a little bit to uh, the issue of uh, stakeholder buy-in, and forgive me, I'm new at, at, with this committee. Um, who does Bone consider to be stakeholders in this particular uh, complex of issues? <laughs> Great question. So we're going to say we have lots of stakeholders and of all different levels. Um, you know, we primarily partner with the Army Corps engineer in a lot of these projects, um, but there's a lot of actors that are in this realm, right? We have various state agencies that we're working with, other federal agencies like NOAA um, for the environmental side of things. But then we also have, you know, kind of the, the local township kind of scale stakeholders, the politicians there. We have consultant firms that are working that actually help design projects and are participating and I would also say that, you know, we are engaging more with our indigenous communities as well, and that they are another uh, community that we need to bring as a key stakeholder. Um, now, defining how far inland we need to go is a great question in terms of our stakeholders. You know, we know that sediment availability and transport offshore starts all the way up in the top part of the drainage basin and works its way down. So how far do we need to go into the drainage basin itself is another question um, that we have. Um, and I would open it to the bone folks if I missed any um, broad categories. It rem reminds me of a public meeting I went to in like 2016. Uh, definitely the local population as well, right? The citizens living along the coast. Um, there was a Florida sand study that was published and the Corps of Engineers conveniently demarked how much sediment was offshore of each county, which really gives the impression that it belongs to the county, even though it's on the OCS. So when one county wanted to use sand from the adjacent county, there was a lot of public outcry. Uh, so those sorts of issues. Uh, also things like environmental groups, right? The surf riders, the surfing community, that, that's a definite vocal minority or majority, depending on where you're at. Um, turtle groups, things like that. Yeah, uh, excuse me, the Jeff Ridener also I'd add, especially up in the um, Northeast, uh, like uh, Virginia, uh, New Jersey, uh, the fishing community is a important stakeholder too. Uh, one of the things again, listening to the conversations yesterday, today, the question of stakeholders, um, you know, broader public, I'm confused a bit about the economic value of, of sand. I think a lot of us aren't even used to thinking about sand as a critical resource, which it clearly is. And so, a com, you know, a, some, some stronger common language about, you know, about the tangible value. Uh, what's the history? You know, how, how much has the, the how much of these communities depended on these resources over time? Uh, the idea that although we don't know the dimensions of sand, we know it's finite. But you know, how do we spend our sand wisely? And and again, it's a it's a it's a, a public communication thing. But I, I figure if I'm confused about it, then some other people are, are as well. And that, that just seems to be a big gap here. Is, is really, you know, I've heard uh, yesterday there was like $21 per cubic meter or something. And then other periods, it's not a value, it's not a commodity resource and all that, but perhaps it should be. But anyway, that's, that's as a story and where I see the pro one of the problems here is, is just how are we, how are we conceptualizing it in a way that works across scales um, that people can understand. Uh, and I don't think that that, that necessarily that hard to do but that's what i'm interested in seeing more about absolutely um i think you highlight something that we have lots of conversations about um within our program um and actually during the workshop we had um one of the members bring up a slogan saying sand is land and you know it's simple but it's powerful i mean it's something that you can uh, kind of equate to right and that is um 
maybe starting to get to the qualitative way to explain the value. Um, but I think there's definitely an opportunity there to further explore how we talk about the value of this particular resource. Uh, Jeff Reidner uh, from Poem. I'll just add that uh, in some circles, we're, we're known as the free sand program because we can't charge, we literally can't charge for the sand that's used for beach nourishment. But uh, Paul brought up an uh, interesting aspect of this uh, discussion yesterday in terms of, you know, there are areas, uh, especially off the, like the mid-Atlantic that has that have heavy mineral mineral components to it. So they may have value, commercial value from that aspect too. And does it make sense to, to put sand on a beach when it has, uh, you know, there's some components to it that have a high commercial value. So yeah, was, this is an interesting topic to, to, to dive deeper into though. Thanks. Katrina. Yeah, Katrin Eichen. Sorry, I'm going away from the stakeholders and everything. We're going actually back to Dina's, Dina or Diana, a question sort of of that um, match, mismatch between ecological and environmental or physical um, sort of scales and, and layers maybe. And um, I absolutely sympathize with that problem. And it's not an easy one because it could that mismatch can go in either direction. If you just take a snapshot of environmental conditions it's probably not super reflective of what sort of type of organisms, um, trophic interactions and all kinds of things you're finding. Um, however, if you go, because the lifespan of these organisms is oftentimes, not all of them, but oftentimes longer than that short snapshot. At the same time, if you, if you, you know, go more with climate change or, you know, decadal projections on the physics or the environment, then of course, you know, that doesn't match also what you are observing in that moment uh, in, let's say, in, in the ecological frame. So maybe one way around, I was just part of a different, um, a different group that actually also interacted with uh, a lot of BOEM folks uh, on uh, the um, MBON, the Marine Biodiversity Observing Networks. Um, we just had a, net, a, 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 a workshop there. And one of the things that was discussed to really start to rely more on certain modeling approaches. And so species distribution models is becoming I mean, it's been out there, but it's becoming more and more a common tool and then habitat suitability modeling. So those are some tools that could maybe be explored to try to match these scales together a little bit more. I'm not an expert on either one. I'm just throwing this out as potential tools to look into. Um, Dina, we might tell people that we actually incorporated some of that in an experimental project. Well, okay, well, <laughs> okay, so working with Dina and the people of BOEM, we had had a contract to create a, a dynamic model of what might be contributing to the value of any given particular patch of sand. And we focused on one organism as a hobby horse, which was the, the American sand lance, because that was a critical link to essential fish habitat. But we could do more of that. I mean, not just us, but like everybody. I, I know, we're, and we're kind of jumping around between the uh, environmental and, and, the, and the, the, the stakeholder. But I, I did have a question on the stakeholder one. And that's how, um, given the example of the, 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 the Corps of Engineers broke it up by county and stuff, there must be a, a quite a serious social justice component to that, right? Yeah. How, how are you guys weighing the, 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 that, or is that included in the, in the calculations, the kind of environmental social justice balance for your stakeholders? So um, I can't really answer that question. Um, but one thing that I will say is that in our effort to include as many folks as possible, we're trying to give them a seat at the table um, so that at least their voices are heard and it's considered and we, we're kind of bringing all facets involved. Um, I don't know if I could speak directly to examples and things like that, but. Hey, this is um, Jessica Malandine from the uh, marine minerals program in the Gulf. Um, specifically with the Corps of Engineers study, 
Um, I don't know how much environmental justice was considered in that particular exercise. Um, they were specifically looking at um, their historical use for the counties and then identified volumes and then trying to determine essentially who was outspending <laughs> the amount that they had to kind of, in a lot of counties, as you saw in that figure, that graphic, a lot are in the red already. So they already have less material than what they're anticipating needing over the lifespan of, of that study that they had considered. I don't know how much more detailed that study went into because it really was specific to um, sediment um, budgets, um, <laughs> their bank, if you will. Um, but I do know that with the core in particular, they do consider um, the, the justice component in their planning exercises. So their 50 year planning documents for some of their larger civil works projects do incorporate that as one of the factors that determines the, the, the economic value of construction of a project as part of the, the, total, the overall calculation. They also have a comparable one for the environmental components where they can calculate a kind of a, a mock value for environmental value of a project. And they, they do that kind of comprehensively as kind of a whole project view. So of course our borrow areas by default for projects that would use them kind of get pulled into that a bit. But I don't know if it's us, we don't, I, I, haven't, I don't know of any where it's directly related to our stuff. Yeah, so adding on to Jessica, so this is Paul Nor. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that the individual projects are typically uh, covered by an environmental assessment, not an EIS. So consequently, the core doesn't routinely do stakeholder meetings and as much outreach as there would be as part of an EIS. I'm not saying there should be, you know, loads of meetings and things, but it's just worth mentioning that because it's a little harder to, you know, get stakeholder feedback when, when you're not having meetings. So yeah, so there's that. Uh, total outside, um, we were talking about the uh, scaling and gathering data a little earlier. Uh, technological developments. I'll point out for critical minerals, we used a, uh, a newer technology called sail drone. It's an autonomous survey vehicle. Uh, basically, you it's a float with multi-beam on the bottom, can do some other things, and it uh, it's pre-programmed, goes out and collects multi-beam very inexpensively over a broad area. So that might be an example of a technology, recent technology that could be applied to, you know, the um, sand and gravel program to uh, to do repetitive surveys, uh, things like that. Yeah, no, just uh, I, I, Kevin, I, I, I certainly really appreciate your question. I, and I think all of us in BOEM do. And there are, you know, there are mandates I mentioned on environmental justice and priorities for tribes. Uh, in the case of environmental justice, mostly what we've done to date in a larger scale is in is concerns offshore wind and it's focused on the New York bike project. But we have a number of things like a, a contract report on best practices. We've set up uh, these EJ forums in respect to New York Biden. And I think we're we're hoping that we can expand that throughout BOEM, all of the programs and all of the geographic area. Uh, and uh, and, and for tribal nations, uh, as well as the EJ question. And the, and the tribal nations are, are, are not stakeholders. The, I think you know they, they're very sensitive about that. They, they're uh, independent sovereign governments or dependent actually under the US constitution. But, uh, but it's, I mean, it's really a good question for us to think about. So we, we, we've got kind of one minute left and then we'll switch over and we'll have, have Jeff introduce the next session, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to suggest that um, you, you take advantage of that atlas of all the sand resources, take into consideration that sand communities, benthic organisms, tend to appear and disappear over the years so that all the habitat is not fully occupied, it moves around. And if there was any way then to either deal with it at a systems level, you know, what is the probability of a given patch being critical 
or to actually know somehow that would be good i'm less i keep forgetting to identify myself yeah and i'm bill brown i apologize too I'm terrible at that great well look thank you very much for that that was a fascinating presentation so i really appreciate it and uh oh there we go Brandon. and and jeff will uh will introduce uh the next uh the next section All right, thanks, Kevin. Yes, yeah, Jeff Ridenauer with the Boehm. Uh, so we're going to pivot now from uh, talking about coastal resilience, sand and gravel, to uh, critical minerals, and this is a, an important uh, recent uh, component of our of our program. Uh, and you know, frankly, it's much different than the work we've been doing with uh, offshore sand and sediment uh, for coastal resilience. It's different in terms of the marine mineral type. Uh, the location of the deposits, and certainly the environmental communities that are associated with the deposits. And uh, as you all probably know, we've talked we talked a bit about this yesterday at the beginning of the meeting. You know, critical minerals is is has been in the news lately, especially uh, in terms of offshore uh, minerals, uh, minerals in international waters. You know, and the geopolitical implications of uh, future deep sea mining. Um, as we mentioned with uh, sand and sediment, we're resource managers. So it's really important for us to know, you know where resources may be located or maybe we don't have any resources on our OCS. We don't even know that at this point in time. So our current approach to critical minerals is concentrating our efforts on fundamentally understanding where critical minerals may be located and then also understanding some of the uh, environmental and ecological aspects of those deposits. So we, I mentioned yesterday, we're, we're really res resource constrained as a program overall, but when we talk about critical minerals and the 3.2 billion acres that we're uh, uh, responsible for, we have been spending over the last couple of years about two and a half million dollars uh, uh, of program funds on critical mineral research. $2.5 million does not go a long way for offshore deep sea uh, research. So we're trying to couple that with partnerships with other agencies, USGS and NOAA, but also leveraging uh, ESP funding. So in terms of using program funding to collect resource information, at the same time, we're gonna use environmental studies funding to collect some environmental information. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and Shannon. I guess, Paul, you're up first. All right. So I'm Paul Knorr, um, and Shannon will chip in too, Shannon Cofield. We're talking not just about nodules today, although that is, is the primary focus generally uh, for our work, given our constrained resources. Uh, next slide. Or do I do that? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so quick agenda, uh, overview of critical minerals, where are they, uh, what are they, and a uh, little bit about our regulatory pathway because it's quite a bit different uh, from the free sand that we've been talking about. Uh, and then a bit on our current research efforts uh, as well as a, a few upcoming projects uh, as opposed to the projects we've already completed. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are critical minerals? <clears throat> they're, they're hard minerals. Um, it's a group of 50 minerals uh, designated by the US Geological Survey. The minerals up on the graphic uh, that are bolded in yellow are the ones that uh, are known or believed to be found within the OCS. Um, I'll point out minerals such as gold, uh, which is a valuable mineral and is a hard mineral, is not a critical mineral. Uh, same with copper. Copper isn't a critical mineral. Uh, it's a hard mineral. Everything I talk about today applies to hard minerals as well as critical minerals. Uh, critical minerals just have the focus because of supply chains. But these minerals don't occur in isolation. You don't, when you pick up a polymetallic nodule, it's not just made of nickel. It's made of 
about 20 different elements. So uh, you, you approach it kind of holistically, uh, critical as well as non-critical uh, minerals when you deal with these things. Uh, so, so really, what is a critical mineral? It's a mineral that's essential to U.S. economic and national security. Different countries have different lists of critical minerals. Most countries have lists of critical minerals, but you know, they don't typically intersect with ours. Um, several of the minerals, such as cobalt, uh, nickel, uh, manganese, are critical to the, oh, sorry about the pun, uh, or repetition, are important to the green energy transition. Uh, also rare earths. The uh, right-hand column is rare earth elements. The reason the list expanded from 35 to 50 a couple years ago was because USGS started listing out the individual rare earths as opposed to lumping them just under the REE category. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, five main types that uh, we would be working with on the OCS. I'll actually start at the upper right-hand corner uh, in the shallowest water. So heavy mineral sands. Uh, this one's typically um, not talked about as much in the concept, context of uh, deep sea critical minerals because it's a shallow water deposit. Uh, most beach sands have some heavy mineral component. If you go out to the beach, you pick up a handful of sand, the dark flecks in the sand, or if you look at the, uh, the little wave ripples on the beach, if there's you know, little dark streaks in those ripples, that's either organic material or heavy mineral sands because they're heavier, gravity pulls them down. Um, off of Virginia, some of the shoals have upwards of 10% heavy mineral component. So 10% of the sand is heavy mineral sand, the rest is quartz. Um, even down to Florida, you wind up with, uh, one to two percent uh, heavy mineral sands. So there's value uh, in those sands, uh, typically titanium. That's the one worth noting. Uh, phosphorites, I'll kind of skip over that. That's typically within dredgeable depths uh, and you would go for phosphorite primarily for fertilizer. Hydrothermal deposits, uh, internationally, they're typically referred to as SMS deposits, seafloor massive sulfides. Those are associated with uh, hydrothermal vents, uh, basically the black smokers that you've probably all seen footage of. Um, the, the ore deposit wouldn't be an active SMS deposit. We're talking about extinct uh, vent systems where the activity is stopped. Next up is cobalt rich ferromanganese crusts. Uh, those are crusts uh, a little less than a foot thick. Uh, contain a lot of cobalt and manganese. They're, they're quite hard. Uh, recovering them uh, is, makes a lot of noise, uh, creates a lot of, uh, of, let's say, ancillary damage because you're basically breaking the crust up off the surface or grinding it up. Polymetallic nodules are potato-sized, well, they vary, but typically potato-sized uh, metal concretions that sit on the seabed. Uh, they form over millions of years. They're found mostly on abyssal plains, although there's an exception I'll talk about a bit later. So in waters between three and a half thousand to 6,000 meters deep, quite deep. Hard to research. When you're uh, trying to touch the bottom at five to 6,000 meter depths, taking a single core sample is basically an all day event. Uh, it takes a long time to get, get your sampling device down and then recover it. Um, yeah. So, but, but that said, uh, pal as far as geographically where these occur from left to right, polymetallic nodules are on the deep abyssal plains. Um, cobalt rich crusts are on the summits and sides of seamounts. Hydrothermal deposits are associated with spreading centers. There's one of those in the United States off of Northern California, the Gorda Ridge system. Uh, phosphorites are near shore, but typically a little deeper than the sand we dredge and heavy mineral sands are shallow water. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, you, you've seen the slides about the BOEM jurisdiction. So 3.2 million acres, uh, the pink is, is where you could find critical minerals, which is pretty much everywhere on the OCS. Uh, I, I have more specific maps a little later on. Um, next slide. 
Okay, so perspective maps. Uh, perspective maps are developed for models and expert knowledge. Uh, USGS uh, collaborates with us or really does, does these. Uh, and um, they use existing data and expert knowledge. It's, it's not quite as much of a mathematical model as you might expect. Uh, there, there's a little bit of art to it. So uh, when the perspective map lines are drawn, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, there's some uh, judgment used. Uh, the perspective maps indicate areas where minerals could be present based on current knowledge. Uh, the colors on this map here, uh, the light tan is potential crust, the green are potential nodule areas, and the red and black triangles are where you might find those seafloor massive sulfide hydrothermal deposits. General Trends Remote Pacific uh, likely has nodules and crusts. Uh, you can see the, you know, those colors within the EEZ areas or OCS areas. The Atlantic likely has, well, we know the Atlantic has heavy mineral sands, um, probably has nodules, uh, and cr we know it has nodules and crusts on the Blake Plateau, but the new ECS area that pushed off the Blake Plateau pushes into the deep Atlantic. There may be nodules there. Um, and then Puerto Rico, um, the northern OCS off of Puerto Rico also pushes into the Atlantic Ocean abyssal area. <clears throat> and there were nodules documented there back in the 60s. Not a lot of recent research. Gulf of Mexico likely has heavy minerals, possibly some brines. Uh, so hope potentially lithium rich, we're investigating that. Uh, there are also nodules in the Gulf of Mexico, but they're very low grade um, due to the sediment influx from the Mississippi. Pacific coast, so the Western coast of uh, continental United States has uh, phosphates down near California, and then those hydrothermal deposits uh, along Gorda Ridge that you can see on the map here as those black splotches between Oregon and Washington. And Alaska, um, heavy minerals and uh, sands in the uh, uh, Bristol Bay, uh, Norton Sound, and then uh, crust deposits up on the Chukchi Peninsula in that OCS expansion area. And uh, there could potentially be some nodules south of the uh, Aleutian Islands. We're doing some work in the Aleutians, looking at hydrothermals, uh, because of course the Aleutians are a volcanic arc. So there's hydrothermal activity there. Next slide, please. Here's a close up of the Western Pacific. Uh, this, is a, this is what a perspective map looks like. Uh, so you, you might see how, how there is a bit of art to this. Um, the kind of finger like shape in the middle that's cross hatched is the Hawaiian, Hawaiian island chain. Um, there's a potential nodule field that extends into the Southern OCS there. That's um, we're planning to do some research this fall, um, a cruise out there to look at that. I'll talk about that a little later. later. On the right side of the screen, the long oblong pale green oval, that's the clearing Clipperton zone, which is where the International Seabed Authority has issued most of its uh, leases. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how do you get these minerals? When we're talking about um, critical heavy mineral sands, you would basically use the same sorts of technology you use to um, dredge beach sand. Uh, but for the deeper minerals, specifically for nodules, the traditional approach is to use a tract harvester. So kind of like a, a combine harvester or a bulldozer. Uh, you put it on the seabed uh, two miles, three miles down and it ro uh, rumbles along on its tracks, uh, scoops up the nodules, and those are then slurried to the surface in a, in a pipe. The nodules are actually friable, so they break easily. So on the way up, they break down into black sand. Uh, that's discharged onto the vessel. The, um, the sand component, the, the nodule component is captured on the vessel, and then the slurry water is, um, reintroduced into the system, 
and there's some different uh, thoughts on where you would do that. Uh, this graphic here has the tailings discharge mid water column, so maybe a mile down. Uh, other concepts um, take it all the way back down and drop the uh, that slurry mixture, plume mixture down back near the harvester. That's the traditional approach. Uh, there's some more creative approaches. This uh, Impossible Metals Company, for instance, postulates and is developing a floating harvester. So this would be about the size of a, a small dump truck. Uh, it, it's buoyant, floats down, doesn't actually touch the seabed, hovers above the seabed, uses la lasers, uh, sonar to identify the nodules, and then uses various machine learning AI routines to identify which nodules to pick up. Uh, because it's imaging the nodules, it could see if there's a starfish on a nodule or, or some other macrofauna, it then avoid that nodule, or it could selectively pick up, leave behind every 10th nodule, for instance. So it uses a little robot arm to pick the nodule up, puts it back in the hopper. Uh, when the hopper's full, it floats back up to the surface. Uh, the company uh, posits, postulates using like 30 to 60 of these simultaneously, uh, constantly moving up and down, uh, recovering nodules. Much lower impact method, uh, most likely you're eliminating that plume formation um, and adding some um, ability to add discretion to the nodules that you're picking up instead of just scooping them all up at once. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a bit about critical minerals and uh, you know how, how they're recovered. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, this is Ruth. <clears throat> how many of the vessels exist internationally, right? So we, you know, from an offshore wind perspective, there's like six vessels that can actually install some of the sizes of turbines. So I'm curious in terms of how many are available um, to do a lot of this deep extraction. So right now, this is a hypothetical field, right? The work that's been done in the Clarion Clipperton zone um, by, for example, the metals company, they have vessels uh, that they work with. They aren't necessarily the full scale vessels uh, that they're, they would use when they actually uh, move commercially, right? Uh, I'll point out from an OCS perspective, unless I'm missing something, it would need to be a U.S. constructed vehicle, Jones Act, all that sort of thing. So as far as I know, we don't have any vessels here. Not necessarily. It would be if that vessel is going to coastwise to coastwise points. So if you were extract, I mean, this is this obviously is going to create some concerns because you could come into the EEZ and extract and as long as you're not at well, a coastal point. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that in this next section where we talk yeah, about regulations and laws. Um, <laughs> Considering we move a lot of big things that aren't U.S. based vessels, but yeah, it's that's I know it's one of the challenges, right, right. In, in this management. Right, right. Well, I think that was one of the challenges for offshore wind, right, is the, yeah. Nothing else? Yeah. I, this is Karen Ashton. I just have a little question. I, mean, I wondered it yesterday, too. Can you tell me what is the Chukchi Peninsula? Okay. Uh, can we go back a couple slides to the one with the U.S. map? Right there. Thank you. Okay. So you see the Bering Sea between, right. So north of the Bering Sea, there's a submerged peninsula, which we refer to, it's the Chukchi Sea. Below that is submerged, the Chukchi Peninsula. Right, we call that the Chukchi Cap. Okay. And the Chukchi Peninsula, I believe, is also that piece of land in Russia that sticks out the, be the, be the, the eastern, uh, the western side of Bering Strait. Which they also call Chukotka. Yeah, you know, they call that Chukotka too, but the, the other side is the Seward Peninsula. But so we were really, I was kind of like, Chukchi Peninsula? I've never heard the Chukchi Cap and North Wind Ridge and stuff called a peninsula before. So yeah, that's that's what we called it when when I was on the ship up there. So yeah. Uh, anyway, the 
those ECS cruises push that boundary out to about 350 miles and it falls right along the international date line. Oh, right. I'm completely aware of that. Okay. I do. Okay. I work up there. So oh, I do. Okay. In Catherine too, that's why we're like so confused about this Chukchi Peninsula thing because we've never heard it called that and it's just not in any of the topography that we've seen. Okay. So duly noted. <laughs> May adjust my terminology. I've been calling that out for like 10 years. So. Uh, okay, let's bump up to regulatory. Next slide. One more. Okay, so why are we doing all this? Um, well, Outer Continental Shelves Lands Act, uh, two sections here for your reference, uh, give us uh, authority for G and G exploration, so as well as for mineral leasing. Uh, somebody mentioned eight K before. Uh, Section K in general uh, covers mineral leasing. Three executive orders from 2017, 2020, 2021 uh, have increasingly uh, drawn attention to and executive put executive focus on critical mineral supply chains. You can imagine between 2020 and 2021 during the COVID pandemic and the supply chain uh, issues that were in the news every single day, uh, there was more attention uh, placed on critical minerals and uh, how they fall into the supply chain. Uh, critical minerals aren't really a new thing. Uh, conceptually, the concept goes back to the uh, World War II era. So uh, first legislation I've seen was in the 1970s where that term was used, uh, but it's really since 2017 where, where kind of that, that lens, that effort's been uh, restarted again. Next slide, please. So we have three regulations to, uh, to cover this. 30 CFR 580 covers prospecting. 30 CFR, CFR's Code of Federal Regulations. 30 CFR 581 covers leasing and 582 covers operations. What's prospecting? Prospecting is when you get permission from BOEM to go out and look for minerals commercially. The data, BOEM receives a copy of the data or can request a copy of the data, but it remains proprietary. Alternatively, if you're not exploring commercially, uh, for example, you're with a university or your company for whatever reason is spending millions of dollars doing pro bono work, uh, you can request a scientific notice or a scientific research permit. Uh, the, there's, the difference basically falls into um, how much you might be impacting the seabed with your activities. So if you're going out and you're touching the seafloor, and it's federal three miles out, except Texas and West Florida where it's nine miles out, um, you, you need one of these permits. Um, the g, &G permit takes a little, little bit of time to acquire, uh, typically 90 days uh, for something really novel like nodule prospects thing. It might be a little longer than that uh, as we, because there's some environmental uh, NEPA work associated with that. Okay. Great. So you have your prospecting permit. You went out. You did all your uh, your G and G prospecting. You know where the minerals are. What happens next? Five uh, thirty CFR five eighty one. You can submit an unsolicited request for a lease sale, which kicks off a multi year process, where the BOEM uh, considers an area for lease for specific types of minerals and decides whether or not to proceed on that. Um, obviously oversimplifying this. There's a lot of work with stakeholders, a lot of uh, NEPA analysis, economic analysis, uh, and the area would typically be uh, narrowed down and shrunk down to uh, the most suitable area. That's then offered up for auction, closed bid auction, uh, very similar to the oil and gas method um, with terms and stipulations and royalties built in. And at the end of the day then, Somebody, somebody receives a lease. Uh, like I said, multi-year process. This is not. This would not be a fast process. The catch is, if you have all that G and G data, that can inform your bid, but it doesn't guarantee 
uh, that you're going to get a lease. So it doesn't provide security of tenure. Um, okay, so let's say you have your lease now. Moving on to 582, that set of regulations covers the actual operations. Uh, there are regs covering delineation of mining sites, testing equipment, as well as the uh, mining operations, closure plans, uh, environmental uh, monitoring measures, all that sort of thing. It's worth pointing out, I think, when you're looking for minerals without a lease, you're prospecting. Under US law, when you're looking for minerals with a lease, you're exploring. They're two different terms. They're not the same thing. Prospecting, pre-lease, exploration, post-lease. ISA uses somewhat different terminology, the International Seabed Authority. So uh, good to get that straight. Once we get the 582, you know, decade away, uh, if we started now, uh, Bessie would certainly be involved through that process, uh, especially once the 582 regs are in, uh, similar to the way they inspect offshore rigs and things like that. Yes. Yeah, before we get off of this, this one's fascinating to me. So <clears throat> if you come with an application for prospecting, mm -hmm. one, how long, what's the window that BOEM has to reply within? And then two, multiple groups could get um, approvals to prospect in overlapping locations, or does then BOEM have to trigger some consideration of competitive interest that they would take that to lead like that. It, it works a little bit different in mm -hmm. uh, oil and gas exploration and production. So I'm curious of how prospecting to leasing would work here and, and thinking of, you know, typically what happens or what's happening in the offshore wind space, right? Is no one can solicit if anybody puts in an unsolicited bid mm -hmm. industry response because they want to drive it to a competitive process um, and go into leasing. So I'm trying to, you know, if the interest is growing around this one, then how do, how does the private sector start kind of pushing the process forward, I guess, right? If you start right. to, you have one application now, you might have people that then just start throwing in stuff for the sake of throwing in something. So I'll let Shannon address the timelines for G&G &G because she's pretty much our G&G &G specialist. Um, I'll point out the G&G &G doesn't, a G&G &G permit, right? The, ge the 580 permit, geological and geophysical prospecting permit is non-exclusive. So multiple companies uh, could receive G&G &G permits to do research in the same area and all the, you know, collect their own data. It is different from the oil and gas model. Uh, the types of data are quite different. Uh, you need fairly high resolution seabed data, which is costly to gather. You can't gather, you know, sub meter uh, bathy from at a 6,000 meter depth from the surface. So you, you need to get an AUV down there, uh, do your surveys uh, much deeper. Um, yeah, Shannon, timeline. Hey everyone, this is Shannon Cofield from BOEM. Um, so to answer the question about uh, G and G timelines for a permit. So remember a permit is gonna be proprietary data, a little bit different than sand and gravel authorizations. Um, that tends to uh, go through our internal lawyers. So it's a little bit of a longer process, but typically for a G and G for exploration, we're looking at 30 to 60 days. Um, sand and gravel, it's typically less than 30 days, but if we need to consult with our lawyers and get some opinions, it could take up to 60 days. So not too long. And it, it could take longer if it's a more complicated uh, area or an area where there hasn't been work done before. Um, you know, I, I don't think Bohm would be doing this work uh, in a vacuum without consulting stakeholders, uh, you know, lo local governments, things like that. Yeah, thanks. So hypothetically, say this takes a, tra a trajectory like offshore wind and you start to get significant interest, then is it a unsolicited process or you kind of, what are you considering from that 
that transfer from 580 to 581. Okay. Procedurally. So I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So with 581, there's, there's a couple separate pathways. Uh, the unsolicited request process, uh, you need to be a qualified requester, which is basically a U.S. citizen or U.S. corporation. The, the bar isn't very high to be a qualified requester. Um, we've identified some pieces of the regulation that could probably use a uh, little fine tuning. Um, that, that might be one of them, but right. In, uh, in theory, anyone can request uh, an unsolicited um, lease sale, not a lease. You can't request a lease. You can only request a lease sale uh, because you know, it's a competitive process. So there's that. Uh, we evaluate that over 45, we have 45 days according to the regs to evaluate the request for a lease sale and reply. Uh, and our replies then either, yes, we will proceed or no, we will not proceed. It's a simple yes or no. We have to provide you know some limited rationale on that. Um, yeah, the, the step after that would typically be an RFI. Uh, request for information where we start gathering information from stakeholders and other agencies and the public. Um, the alternative uh, path forward is the Secretary of Interior tells us to develop a lease sale. So th those are the two methods. Uh, does that, that answer your question? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after, I think we can, yes. Hey, this is Shannon Cofield from Boehm again. Um, one thing I did want to point out to the group that's very important, and it's a very um, distinct difference between sand and gravel for, I'm just going to stick with G&G because that's my specialty, is for sand and gravel, we have a programmatic environmental assessment, a programmatic EA that covers our sand and gravel activities, which makes the process of going through and, and, and issuing an authorization or, or a permit for sand and gravel G&G GNG is uh, geophysical and geological exploration, um, makes the process much smoother. Uh, that does not exist for critical minerals. And I think we're gonna touch on that in a little bit, but I did wanna point that out, that that, um, that is a bit of a challenge uh, when it comes to evaluating a GNG for critical minerals. Right, go ahead. Yeah, Paul, and I, I'm just, a, uh, it's, th this might be a good moment to, to pause for for our break and let everyone have a stretch and i know i have a critical restroom <laughs> that i have to go so uh You're not so the let's one. let's pause here for 15 minutes and we'll come back to your presentation okay great all right with <laughs> thank you we'll start off with a quick announcement from yeah. karen please Okay, everybody, listen up. <laughs> well, all right, you don't hear, you don't. Hear. Anyway, so I made, was able to make a reservation for 20 people at this tango at 6 p.m. We are going to be in a semi-private room, probably at two tables, and they said we could do separate checks. So see you there. And it, op you. it opens, it's open all afternoon, and so if you want to go early and have a drink in their bar, that would, no, go for it. <laughs> well, I actually had do you need? I yes. had an option of private, but it, it, I, I asked about music, and they do with music, but it's the, the semi-private area is far away from the music. Good. And I just couldn't see us being like locked into a room because that just seemed a little, you know, we've been locked into a room all day, and I thought maybe it would be kind of more fun to have a little feeling of us being out in the world. So. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we're ready to go. Paul, please uh, proceed. Okay. Thanks. Uh, good. Perfect. Uh, one more comment before we jump to the next slide, which actually has more details on the 581 timeline. Um, just want to point out the 580 environmental assessment is cur currently uh, somewhat ad hoc right? Uh, because we don't have a programmatic for that or anything like that. So it'd be on a case by case um, basis. Second point is with the 581 reg, uh, actually, let's jump to the next slide, please. So this is the 581 timeline. 
Um, step one on the far left, applicant submits an unsolicited request to lease minerals to move from 1A to 1B or, or to 2. Uh, that's 45 days that the agency has to respond to 1A, applicant submits to an unsolicited request. That's not an agency action. BOEM isn't committing to, to doing anything other than really an RFI and looking a little more. Um, so there isn't any formal environmental assessment. It's not a NEPA action. Um, it's just a decision over 45 days whether to invest more time and money in investigating whether it's worth having a lease sale or not. NEPA kicks in right after that. So you do your RFI, right? Which usually like a 90 day process, maybe six months. Um, you'll see steps two, three, and four here. Adjacent states may form a task force with BOEM to coordinate and share information. It says task force. It isn't necessarily a formal task force. It could be some other sort of uh, uh, formal agreement, data sharing, uh, meetings. Uh, through that process, NEPA work is done. Uh, also through that process, and some of these things occur concurrently, uh, you know, not sequentially, BOEM looks at the requested location, tract size, uh, does its NEPA review, there's public involvement, typically uh, stakeholder meetings, uh, outreach. And then uh, at the end of that, after several years, BOEM, if it decides, could issue or propose a leasing notice. I'll point out the BOEM director uh, signs the letter, makes the decision to move from step 1A to the next step. Beyond that, uh, in the regs, it's typically the Secretary of the, of the Interior that becomes the decider. Uh, and there are multiple breakpoints where the process can be stopped uh, and just ended. So uh, this isn't, you know, it, it, it's not like pushing a boulder off a cliff where you're starting an avalanche. It's more of pushing a steamroller along a road where if you stop applying pressure, you stop. Um, it, it's not a foregone conclusion once you start the process. So after a proposed leasing notice is issued, after several years again, governors of adjacent states, which in the territories, the territories are considered to be states according to the Inflation Reduction Act amendments to OXLA. So American Samoa, Guam, the government, uh, the governors of those territories are for all effective purposes, uh, state officials um, and would be included the same way. So they provide comments on the proposed lease sale, uh, keeping in mind they were probably part of the task force that developed the, the lease sale to begin with. Um, after the comments are received and addressed, uh, BOEM would issue a leasing notice, more public meetings, similar to the oil and gas process. And then there's uh, the closed, closed bid process auction uh, for seven and step eight after the, uh, the bids are reviewed, uh, financial analysis is done, um, a, a lease is issued. Uh, some of the bullets on the bottom there, environmental assessment occurs at every step. Uh, secretary can stop work. The current minimum lease period is 20 years. So by the reg, leases must be issued for at least 20 years with prescribed terms and conditions. Um, and the terms and conditions could uh, include things, uh, environmental mitigations, uh, recovery methodology, royalties, uh, all that sort of thing. It isn't as formally defined as the oil and gas program. So the terms and conditions would probably be a little more robust and specific. Uh, any, there aren't any questions. We could go to the next slide. Next slide, yeah, thanks. Okay, so internationally, it's a bit different. Uh, BOEM is only responsible for the OCS. Uh, once you're outside of the OCS, it's the International Seabed Authority, which is part of the United Nations. They were established in 94 under uh, UNCLOS, which of course the U.S. is not a signatory to. Um, the ISA regulates mineral-related activities beyond 
any national jurisdiction, so international waters, high seas. Um, as the U.S., yeah, so we do attend ISA meetings. Uh, there's typically one or two BOEM staff, along with USGS, NOAA, State Department, some others um, that attend the ISA meetings, which are three times a year in Jamaica, um, but we're observer status. As I understand it, uh, we typically work our comments through Norway or the United Kingdom um, to provide input. Um, as I also understand it, uh, not all the nations that participate in, in these ISA meetings are vocal or really convey necessarily um, lengthy opinions, So the but the U.S. typically does. Uh, so just by the fact of us showing up and, you know, providing comments, I think we do have some influence there, uh, even though we're not part of the uh, formally part of the treaty. There are exploration regulations in place. Uh, exploitation regulations are still being developed. Uh, they were supposed to be done about a year ago, but uh, as I understand it now, it's probably at least another year before those are finished. On the map to the right, you see that um, pale green rectangle. That's the clarion Clipperton zone. So that's the official boundary of the zone. Um, the purple area, the purple kind of whale-shaped, airplane-shaped area within the CCZ, that's the nodule-rich area. Um, if you look at a close-up of that, which is available on the ISA website, you'll see it's divided into set-aside zones for environment, as well as zones for exploitation. And those boundaries north and south of the purple polygon are uh, largely set-asides. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that it's about as large as the United States. It's, it's quite a large uh, area. I think China has five contracts within the CCZ, but they have several contracts outside of it as well, uh, including uh, as clo very close to Northern Mariana Islands within like 30 miles of the OCS there. So it isn't just the CCZ, there are lease areas all over. That said, Bohm doesn't manage that. That's, uh, yeah, we, we just keep track of it. Internationally, NOAA, <clears throat> in theory, well, not in theory, in fact, through the Deep Sea Hard Minerals Resources Act of, I think, 1982, might be 83, uh, has leasing authority in international waters. They issued four leases to Lockheed Martin um, back in the 80s before ISA was established. Uh, two of those leases uh, Lock Lockheed still has. Uh, the other two, I think they've relinquished. Um, but no, no additional work has been done outside of that internationally uh, under the NOAA authority. Next slide, please. Okay, so shifting a little uh, more into the current research effort. So what are we doing with the two and a half million dollars that we roughly have uh, each year to uh, research all this? Next slide, please. Well, for, we use our uh, strategic priorities, so these five items, advanced resource evaluation and environmental assessment standards and information assets, um, assessment of offshore critical minerals, understanding of baseline environment, um, support technologies uh, that efficiently and cost effectively assess the minerals and provide accessible information on the minerals. So that's, that, those are the priorities we have uh, for our spending and for our, for our effort. You'll see that resource evaluation and environment appears on this uh, slide several times. We, the Marine Minerals Program leverages much of its funding with the environmental program. Uh, deep sea work, uh, remote work is, you know, the mobilization costs are so high that it's kind of foolish not to gather both sorts of information at the same time. Uh, it's also worth pointing out, you know, BOEM is a, a regulatory agency. So our science informs our decisions. We're not out doing research. Well, at least I'm not. I'm not out doing research for fun, uh, just for the sake of doing science. Uh, the science is for the sake of making decisions about actions. So if there's no resource in an area, uh, that, that doesn't, a lack of a resource kind of disincentivizes, disincentivizes 
um, the need to go out to do environmental research in that area, understanding that, you know, ecosystems are connected and all that, but two and a half million dollars. So we're kind of focusing on where the resources actually are. Next slide, please. So here's some of the work uh, that we're doing, going to do, have done, uh, going clockwise, top right, uh, Wallops Island. So that's a NASA launch facility on Virginia Beach or on the beaches of Virginia. Uh, there are heavy mineral sands there. I've mentioned those before. Uh, we're looking at the feasibility of extracting those heavy minerals in the, uh, in the course of a beach nourishment project. So if you're bringing a million cubic yards of, of critical mineral rich sand to the beach to put on the beach, would it be possible, cost effective, economically uh, worthwhile to try to extract at least a portion of those critical minerals from the sand before you put it on the beach? Uh, there isn't any particular value to heavy mineral sands on a beach from a protection standpoint versus just having quartz. Uh, the only thing that changes slightly is the color. Um, so we're working on that study, uh, hopefully next year, there's a nourishment, uh, plan nourishment of wallops, the, um, NASA facility plan there next year. Uh, next one down the Blake plateau. Oh, thanks. Yeah, not next. Slide. I'll, I'll be on this slide for a couple minutes. Uh, Blake plateau historic test site. Uh, there's a slide on this a little later, uh, for more detail. But Blake Plateau, 800 meters water depth, about 150 miles offshore of, say, Charleston. Uh, so offshore of South Carolina, Georgia, 800 meters of water. Mang the, we have crusts there and nodules. That's very unusual. You usually don't find those in 800 meters of water. Uh, the nodule quality isn't as rich uh, tip overall as deeper Pacific nodules. But there are um, there are certainly critical minerals in those nodules. In 1970, Deep Sea Ventures uh, did some test mining there. They uh, this was in the very early optimistic period of deep sea mining. So 1970, they went out and tested multiple methods of recovering nodules. Um, what you see here in the small blue. Um, area uh, next to the robot arm is a nodule track. I think I have a better picture of it a little later. But basically, they plowed along, uh, collected some nodules, pushed some aside as the uh, their bulldozer uh, collector uh, moved along the seabed. So th that's we're planning to use that as a recovery experiment, uh, basically to go back and document recovery, uh, ecological change, differences from the non tested areas versus the tested areas. Next one down, Gulf of Mexico salt brines. So there are a number of salt brine uh, deposits on the deep seabed of the Gulf of Mexico, say 2000 meter water depth. These are very um, saline brines that can be hundreds of meters deep. Um, we are curious what, what as to what the mineral composition of the salt is. Uh, typically, the only available information on these sub submarine salt brines is that there's a salinity value. That doesn't really tell you about the lithium content or anything else. So uh, we have a trip planned uh, this fall through University of Southern Miss, University of Mississippi, um, to recover salt, so some fluid from the salt brine and do an analysis of it. They've been studied, you know, I wouldn't say intensely, but they've been studied ecologically. So uh, there's usually um, muscle colonies and things like that, uh, methanophiles uh, that are around the salt brines. But the brines themselves, uh, other than perhaps some bacteria, are pretty much devoid of any sort of life because the salt layers are so high. Uh, next over, tech development. Uh, we're working with a couple companies, uh, one in particular, Impossible Sensing, which is a company that works with uh, JPL as well. They develop in, uh, probes and sensors for interplanetary uh, probes. Uh, the idea is, can we apply some of those uh, spectrophotometric methods to the deep sea? 
So basically, as opposed to bringing a nodule up to do an assay in a lab, can we send the probe down, the spectrometer down to shoot a laser, do a little ablation, and then get a spec reading and do at least on a gross level, um, do an assay of what the potential mineral content is. Uh, that would be far more cost effective than, than bringing nodules to the surface. Again, considering the uh, transit time of dropping a box core and bringing it back up. Uh, that's just one example. We have a cu couple similar efforts. Uh, Hawaii Abyssal Plane, uh, that cruise is scheduled for September of this year. And that's basically to go to the very southern end of the big island of Hawaii, uh, to, not to the southern end, to go to the southern extent of the OCS offshore of the big island of Hawaii uh, and do some box coring. Uh, other work as well, but uh, part of the, the goal is to bring up uh, box cores of nodule samples uh, along with you know, some of the small biota there. Um, in part, this is, uh, this is definitely resource and environmental exploration. We don't know if there's nodules there. We suspect there might be because that clearing Clipperton zone prospective area abuts the OCS. Um, and there isn't any particular reason why it should stop at the OCS. There probably would be nodules in that area. Uh, we did some science there a few months, a couple months ago, back in November. Uh, we gathered some multi-beam in the area to uh, fill in some of the data gaps, uh, hone in on areas where, where we could do some further research. Moving up, uh, Escanaba Trough, Gorda Ridge, that's the uh, arrow that's the pointing from the, uh, what, 30 degrees west over towards the Pacific coast. Uh, this was a USGS uh, BOEM NOAA cruise on the, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, we used the J RV Jason and the AUV Sentry in tandem to collect uh, bathy on the deep seabed and then um, collect physical samples. Uh, what you see there hanging over the side of the ship, it's about the size of uh, maybe a minivan. Uh, that, that's the Jason, goes down, went down about 3,000 meters looking for these hydrothermal vents. And it's controlled from the ship, from a control van on the, on the vessel. And we were able to recover uh, samples, uh, many biological samples. Uh, water samples, but also some mineral samples. For example, in the image here, that's a piece of extinct chimney, uh, copper rich. Then the top image is the Western Aleutian Seamounts. Uh, I mentioned sail drone uh, earlier today, I think. Uh, that image there is their largest sail drone. It's about 60 feet long. Uh, that deployed about a year and a half ago in the Western Aleutians to look for uh, hydrothermal areas in preparation for another cruise, a follow-on uh, science cruise next year, where we plan to go to some of these potential hydrothermal areas to uh, do ecosystems analysis and, and look at the resources. Um, this one's also led by USGS. On this particular map, the, so the ASV collected uh, just over a course of a few days, this particular um, slice of bathy that you see here, very high quality data. It, it's, you know, it's doing its own thing controlled from, I think the control centers in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, so there's somebody on a keyboard, you know, telling it where to go, adjusting for the winds. It has a, uh, has a sail and sail drone to catch the wind. It also has uh, an engine inside, you know, if the wind's not favorable. Um, it was actually gathering data during a gale that blew through. So this thing is really robust. Uh, and because of the size of this platform can work in deep seas despite the waves and everything. Any questions about these? These are all our, for the most part, projects are either locked in very near term or that we've completed. Okay, next slide. Okay, yeah, I guess I have a couple more slides. Okay, so here's Escanaba Trough. That's the Jason ROV, mentioned that. Uh, that's the minivan size thing. 
uh, drops down a couple miles on a cable. I think the maximum operational depths like five and a half thousand meters. So it can get to those abyssal depths. Uh, I didn't put the black tape on the, the sentry, but the thing with the smiley face, that's the sentry. It's about maybe two meters high. Uh, it's autonomous. So you program it, put it in the water and then collect it about 18 hours later. It works really well deploying these two in tandem. Um, that was a lesson we learned because you can gather very good bathy, which then lets you very precisely pick a target site for the Jason, keeping in mind that these areas are largely uncharacterized or un underexplored. So the bathy is not very good to begin with. Uh, what did we find down there? Hydrothermal vents, sediment beds. Uh, copper seemed to be the primary mineral. Um, this isn't, well, yeah. We were on this particular mission targeting more of the extinct or vents or vents that were going extinct. extinct. Uh, cruises in earlier decades were focused on the more active systems. So these are the systems that are uh, less active or in some cases completely inactive. How do you determine that? There's a temperature probe on the JSON. You, you, know, you, you find the water and you poke it in. And if the water's not hot, then it's pretty much extinct. Uh, and that usually coincides with your pillar, your black smoker, not having anything growing on it uh, because there's no nutrients coming out. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a study we have planned for next year. Uh, definitely welcome input on this one. Um, the leads on these, it's, it's again USGS. USGS is a, a big partner for us. Uh, in this case, this is more ecological. Our USGS resource partners tend to be out of Santa Cruz, uh, Amy Gartman, Kira Mazel, um, experts on critical minerals that operate out of there. For this study, it's Amanda Demopoulos uh, out of the USGS Center in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, what we plan to do there, you can see on the image to the right, there's that test track I was talking about. There are many kilometers of, of these tracks. Uh, a couple of years ago, 2022, uh, we documented the area with uh, a Huggins uh, AUV and collected upwards of half a million high-res photos, uh, gathered just off the, the seabed at 800 meters, fine-scale bathy, sub-bottom, side scan. Um, that's all being stitched together. It's almost finished as a data product. Uh, and Back in the 1980s, USGS went out, took a bunch of photos of the area and found some of the mine tracks and put down some patio plot blocks. So basically the, the paving material you, you'd use in your backyard in the patio, they dropped those with numbers written on them. Uh, we were able to locate, I think, all of them. Um, so that's a good initial step once we start recovering those or investigating those as far as recovery processes. Uh, sedimentation, things like that. They, they make a nice control. Um, but in the upcoming experiment for next year and the year after, uh, what we'd like to do is document that ecological recovery, set up a set of flexible recovery experiments. Our funding is clearly limited, so we can't really commit to going out to Blake every other year for the next decade. Uh, that, that's not going to work. Uh, but we, what we can do is set up a set of experiments that could re, be retrieved kind of ad hoc when a ship happens to be in the right area. We could pay a little extra to retrieve the experiment. Uh, so that, that's what we're kind of thinking as a longer term experiment. Uh, and also from the resource side, uh, because it is marine minerals, uh, we will continue delineating the resources. Uh, we, you know, we, have a, we know there are nodules there, but what's the density uh, what, what are they, what's the value, how far is the extent, and importantly, what, what habitats surround this area. Uh, there are cold water corals uh, and other ecosystems and habitats in this area, but not within necessarily the nodule rich area. Uh, water currents, bottom currents. Uh, this isn't, as I understand it from industry, this isn't really a, a high this would not be considered a high priority target. The nodules just aren't worth that much. Uh, there might be an offset because they're in shallower water and they're fairly close to shore. 
uh, but the value of them is is not commensurate with CCC nodules or Cook Island nodules, for instance. The image on the left, uh, I think this is uh, worth pointing out too. So the little bulldozer there that you see, that, that's the test mining site in general, a few square kilometers. Um, that perspective model I mentioned for nodules, uh, that's, that's where the perspective module, nodule model <laughs> shows nodules, tongue twister there, sorry. Uh, you can see it doesn't coincide. It kind of highlights the fact that these perspective models are models, right? They, they shouldn't be taken too literally. They only indicate that the conditions are there set for a resource to be present. Doesn't mean it is, doesn't mean it isn't. So this particular site is outside of the perspective area. Uh, the faint orange line that runs through that perspective area, which is the, the salt and peppery looking area, that's the old OCS boundary. When the EEZ or when the OCS was extended by the expanded continental shelf, that's the bright yellow line. So that's the new area, which is, uh, there's certainly data out there. Um, you know, UNH, State Department gathered a lot of, NOAA gathered a lot of information to provide the justification to extend the ECS, but they weren't focused on nodules on the seabed. Right, they're looking at deep geology, the roots of the craton, uh, that sort of thing. So, so that could be a potential study area in the future. Uh, are there resources out there in this area which is perspective for nodules and extends into much deeper water? The eastern side there um, goes into several thousand meters of water depth because at that point it's in the uh, abyssal plain depths. Next slide. Okay, uh, so more, uh, let's say, policy or regulatory focused studies that we have that don't involve, you know, paying a million dollars for a ship. Um, this critical minerals environmental assessment framework. This is uh, this made the national studies list, uh, three hundred thousand, and has matching funds or leveraging funds from operational funds from marine minerals. Um, and the idea with this one, uh, or I think we're deferring it to next fiscal year, just because we received our funding so late, but is to engage the National Academy to identify information needs peculiar, peculiar to the deep sea uh, mineral, minerals environment and the actions that would take place there, uh, activities. Uh, to I help identify which baseline environmental parameters should be gathered or prioritized. And then also to review existing information to look for information gaps. Basically help us figure out what we don't know and what we need to know from a studies perspective. Um, so identify needs, data gaps associated mostly with nodules, maybe with heavy mineral sands. Um, keeping in mind the, the budget, right? And we don't, we'd rather have a good product for a limited scope instead of uh, generic information for a much broader scope. I, or may, maybe, you know, that's, that's where you could weigh in with the other, would the reverse be uh, preferable. Also assessment needs specific to critical mineral prospecting, leasing and operations. They have three very different impacts. Uh, op prospecting, you're recovering small quantities of nodules, but most of the work with prospecting involves an AUV gathering uh, low energy geophysical data. So it, it isn't really impactful in the sense that a G and G oil and gas survey would be where you're firing off boomers and trying to get deep seismic data. Deep seismic doesn't matter much for a nodule. It's sitting on the seabed. Uh, so, like I said, just a very different approach, different needs. Uh, leasing, uh, well, that, that's definitely more of a programmatic, bigger picture, economic impacts, things like that. And then operations, that's, again, focusing on a specific site. What is this recovery technology going to, how is this going to impact the seabed, the environment, the ecology, and uh, downstream impacts? Also what's needed to document the environmental baseline. Like I said, this, this proposed NASM study uh, is much more focused on the study side, help us develop studies. 
there's another, the next slide has a separate project that's more focused on developing those baseline requirements, the more operational aspects. Okay. Does that, that make sense? They, they kind of work together, addressing separate needs. There aren't any questions here. Next slide, please. Yeah. I'm just wondering, Paul, is there a routine protocol for um, for biodiversity, like eDNA or something like that, that is incorporated into any of these exploratory activities? I wouldn't say it's routine, but for example, on the sail drone uh, mission, and I believe on Escanaba, we gathered eDNA and data okay. with both of those. Uh, I think Ambari was our partner there. Um, and I, I think they're still processing the samples. Uh, keep in mind the that Escanaba Gorda Trough cruise, to, that was still on the tail end of COVID. So everything was still backed up. Uh, I think we're finally unraveling that. I, I think in the future, that's that's one of the things that could be part of a protocol for sure. Uh, acoustics, uh, all those sorts of things, especially given these remote environments, we wanna gather, You know, it's so expensive to get out there. You wanna gather as much information as possible, get as many collaborators. Um, you're not just going to pick up a nodule. It's you want you, you want the full picture when you go out there. Uh, most bang for the buck. And it, uh, the advantage of that actually winds up being that other agencies are also interested in collaborating because they see that opportunity as well. Uh, I think Mark Mueller's online. Uh, he's he's part of our. He, he's an integral part of the team and uh, is. Hey, Mark, do you want to jump in? Talk hey. about. Yeah, sure. I was um, putting comments in the chat too, but yes, that's correct. Sail drone surveyor in Bari. Um, they're working on processing that right now. Um, and uh, Tom Hergen's comment is correct. That was just surface water for that one. But in uh, Hawaii last year, we actually collected throughout the water column and at the seafloor with this um, pretty cool benthic lander, the deep autonomous profiler. And USGS, uh, Cheryl Morrison is working on processing those samples. Um, so eDNA, whenever we can, we, we like to collect it. It does provide useful distribution information. And it's um, one of the environmental uh, programs, areas of interest to do that whenever possible. Thanks, Mark. I think M Mark's a NOMEC co-chair. So that positioning really helps us with our collaborations with a lot of uh, a lot of the potential partners. Was that what you're, yeah, okay. Um, I, I'll also point out, I'm a geologist. <laughs> so I have a somewhat holistic background. I did ocean acidification and worked with benthic foram, stuff like that. So, so I get the environmental piece, but one of the things we're looking at to kind of, you know, build up our bench, build our critical minerals team is to add a dedicated environmental person to manage these sorts of projects. Uh, you know, I, I can do the contracting piece, but, it, but honestly, even if I were fully competent with something like eDNA, just the optics of having your critical minerals geologist managing the environmental component, it's, it's just, it's not good, right? So, um, yeah, see you laughing there, Bill. <laughs> Okay. Uh, this is Megan. I'll add, we're also looking at a deep sea ecologist to be added in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm Stan Costi. I just wanted to follow up on that because obviously, if you know, so if you're showing us how little we know about the geology of the deep sea, then the extra, it doesn't take much to, to realize what little we know about the biology of the deep sea. And, and I say that I've sat on a lot of marine biodiversity working groups, and I don't do deep sea stuff, but I'm always hearing how little we know. And so it just, it, it's good to hear that you guys are appreciating that because if you're ever gonna do the environmental assessment, we have to know something about what's out there. And I guess that's part of part of the, the challenge is you're, you're just trying to figure out what's out there mineral wise. And the biology is much more complicated in terms of not just the there's this resource, but the interactions of all the different things. And so it, it is a extremely challenging. And of course, we all know that things in the deep sea happen very slowly. 
and and so yeah, it's it's a challenge, and I'm, I'm it's good to hear you are embracing that. But I also would say, from a basic science, it's tremendous opportunity to learn about this ecosystem, which we know so little about. Thanks, and I agree completely. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually let me just say we. Uh, geologists are definitely appreciated and and uh and we are you're right dan but we are we are keenly interested in in using the environmental studies program and to support you know environmental uh work yeah, yeah just jumping in here and more or less echoing uh, what dan was saying um i just when you earlier you said okay so we know if they're active or not by probing the temperature and everything and if they're not then we're not having um, this specialized community anymore like the chemosynthetically based community and that's uh, that's correct but it is a hard structure in a vastly soft sediment dominated system and so the critters will still go there they might not be based on chemosynthesis anymore but you will still have a very rich biological community on those even extinct smokers and everything. So I, I do think, yes, there, there is this need for a biological assessment in those areas as well. Agreed. And uh, out at Escanaba, uh, I, I was definitely there more as an observer, right? Um, watching things uh, happen. But, you know, between the hydrothermal outcrops, it's basically gray mud. Uh, there isn't a whole lot going on. There's occasional methane seeps and there's some mussels associated with that. And, you know, there was a beer can uh, and, a couple, you know, a couple other little little things. But the, the light, <laughs> yeah, beer can wasn't from us. It was, we got a picture. Somebody could probably date it. I think, a, what's that? Bud. <laughs> yeah. Two miles deep, 100 miles offshore. It's everywhere. Um where am I going with this? So those hard area outcrops, the, the ones with warmer water definitely had higher, you know, as a geologist looking at a TV screen, looked like they had higher bi biodiversity. Uh, and the lower temperature ones or the ones with none had much lower, but it wasn't, there was fauna there. It just wasn't as lush or diverse as, as on the, the hotter areas. And there's a trend from north to south uh, in temperature. So things like that could inform, you know, decisions about it. Honestly, it's the only spreading center uh, on the outer continental shelf. I'd be kind of surprised if that became a leasing target just from a habitat standpoint and everything like that. Uh, but it's, it's worth investigating because it's a resource and it, you know, informs us. Uh, it's a known area, it's, you know, been of interest for at least 40 years. Um, first Gord emissions were back in the 80s. Okay, so the second study uh, is not CMEF, which is with the National Academy. This one is to develop environmental assessment methods. Uh, so environmental evaluation of critical and hard offshore mineral programmatic reference. So basically building up a document, a uh, set of baselines, uh, standards, to help inform environmental assessments. Uh, like most government agencies, we have timelines we have to operate under and for unusual types of work, unusual activities like this, it would be helpful to have standards and references in place, uh, easily accessible, um, as opposed to you know, trying to piece all this together from journal articles or, or from other countries or ISA documents. I mean, that, that's not how we want to do business. So the idea with this uh, particular study is to gather those materials into a BOEM, um, BOEM document, basically. Um, and this, again, this is not something, you know, I'll be running. Um, you want to talk about this one a little, Shannon? Sure. This is Shannon Cofield from BOEM. Um, I am also a geological oceanographer, so this is not my specialty. But the SMEs within BOEM that wrote this, some of them may be online, um, are very qualified in their, <laughs> in their education. So um, I did want to say the 
the emphasis in this one is to do a desktop study, um, collect a couple of these pieces up here, and I can go into details on some of these very generally, um, since we haven't we haven't actually gone out for um, to solic solicit this study yet. But the goal is to develop um, some sort of environmental guidelines that will guide us developing the regulations. So we're not asking the team or the academics or whoever we get for the study to develop um, federal regulations, right? That's completely outside of the scope of their expertise. Um, I will say that this is, Paul, I think mentioned it very quickly. This is phase two. Uh, phase one, we are about to publish on our website and they don't necessarily go together directly, but they do complement each other. And phase one was a desktop resource evaluation of all of the known critical minerals and hard minerals within US federal waters. Um, they did also include the extended OCS, uh, even though they didn't have to in the beginning. So we have a really nice comprehensive report, uh, which will be available for the public to take a look at it probably within the week or so. Um, so that's overview on this one. If anyone has specific questions on this as we roll along, I'd be happy to answer what I can answer. Okay, so in summary, the previous slide focused more on the studies aspect. This slide, this project focused more on the assessment uh, side. Uh, next slide, please. There's only like one or two slides left, so you're almost done with me. Okay, some additional research possibilities. Uh, so the Marine Minerals Res Resources Research Act uh, from 1996 was, well, was passed in 1996. It's congressionally mandated, uh, but not fully funded. Uh, the goal of that MMRRA uh, resource, I'll just call it the Research Act, um, was to provide, to gather information about marine mineral resources in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, in order to do that, uh, three marine mineral technology centers were opened. University of Mississippi, which was focused on continental shelf regions. So these are, I imagine, you know, a lab, right? So a room within a department at a university. So University of Mississippi focused on the continental shelf. Uh, which makes sense given the you know oil and gas component in the Gulf and the proximity of the UMIS. University of Hawaii at Manoa um, focused on deep seabeds and nearshore island environs. And uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks was focused on the Arctic and cold water regions in general. Uh, those are closed at this point. Uh, so they were open for a bit. They did some work, uh, some more than others, but you know, funding basically. Uh, cause those to uh, close. That being said, uh, the law is still in place and the law apparently gives us grant authority for research and development related grant authority, which is we, the BOEM doesn't typically exercise, uh, related to marine mineral resources and uh, associated environmental aspects. Um, so th we're thinking uh, this would be worth looking into. Um, it would give us some, some ways of working with partners that are more difficult through the traditional uh, competitive contracting, uh, things like that. Um, but we, we need to, you know, fit, figure out, thread the needle on this because uh, developing a new procurement method and convincing uh you know, the, the people that do procurement to actually implement it is, uh, can be challenging. Um, I, I think, yeah, so stay tuned for that. Um, but that could be a, an avenue for us. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and I believe this is the last slide and these were uh, some primer questions on, you know, to, to, provide food for thought for discussion, uh, although I'm not sure they're really necessary. There's probably already a lot of that. So 
So I'll, I'll wrap it up there and, you know, happy to take questions or anything like that. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this, uh, and it's a good, uh, good spread of questions too. So we'll put it to the committee if they can take a shot at any of the questions or have questions of their, their own. Dan, you're, uh, you're up. I was waiting for an entree to talk about marine mammals. <laughs> uh, you, you have uh, the issue of deep diving whales. And I would say that the deepest dive is on the order of 2,000 meters. And it's, most of them are working around 1,000 meters. And anything beyond that is, is pretty occasional. Uh, so, I mean, that's a starting point. And the, the other thing I was going to say about the whales is there's an increasing understanding of whale falls as island as islands of resources that that concentrate things on the deep ocean floor and that's an interesting ecological component but the other thing i i'm thinking about is if you guys are doing these broad surveys of large swaths of the ocean it's a great opportunity to see how common these whale falls might actually be and one of the arguments is because of the whaling, the historical whaling, the whale populations are depleted and we've significantly reduced those islands, uh, resor that, that resource of whale falls as islands to hopscotch across the, the bottom. It would be interesting um, to have some, you know, if you guys are doing a large scale survey where you're just looking at the bottom, it'd be interesting to see how often or if you even see whale falls. Yeah, this is Katrin. Um, so yeah, going with the biology route here and picking the other one of that of that block there, <laughs> benthic <laughs> uh, uh, animals or organisms. Um, Jack and I were actually just sort of whispering in, in the background here. But one of the things that's also, we just talked eDNA as probably a very powerful tool, but eDNA only works as well as the library you have to compare your sequences against. So I think actually that the deep sea and particularly the hydrothermal vent community uh, was very groundbreaking in, in, in using genetic tools and whatever. But I think it's really important to make sure that you have a good meta barcoding library so that eDNA can become that powerful tool that it can be if you know what you're comparing it to. So um, that's also maybe one priority to create that library so that in the future, you know, you you know what you're looking at. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I think, for example, I think a lot of the Escanaba samples are being processed by Amanda Demopoulos. Uh, and it, I'm pretty sure part of that process includes eDNA barcoding. And I believe uh, that some of those samples are then sent to the Smithsonian, to the uh, BOEM funded repository there. Um, uh, do we also gather eDNA there or, or? publish that or is that separate if that makes sense i uh, actually what i get what i'd say i think this is a great point we're uh, and we are uh, we're keenly interested in expanding the use of edna and we're linking it to a number of our studies and actually it's it's pretty clear isn't it that uh that you know like deep sea bed mining and actually dredging of minerals in general is like a great opportunity to take samples on that um the uh what i'm not sure about that uh, you got me thinking is that you know you it, it's becoming much easier to uh sequence more dna than in the past and and uh uh, and DNA sequences have, have long been sent to GenBank. Uh, and uh, I actually, I haven't thought about the connection there, but it's something worth thinking about that we, as part of our research funding, we then would require sampling and some yeah, sort of so process. It's, it's, yeah. it's, the eDNA sample is basically a parcel of water and you yeah. analyze the dispersed fragmental DNA in there. Um, but what I was talking about is the meta genome part barcoding where you actually sample a piece of an organism and you identify it and then you match a sequence with a name and then you can match that eDNA um, sequence to that. 
Right. So it's a multi-step process. But yeah. maybe you're doing this all this already. I I just don't. Yeah, know. I mean, I, I think uh, yeah, we, well, we, I think we are familiar with that. Uh, um, I'm not sure we're systematically uh, doing what you're suggesting. It's a, probably a good idea, and our our role would not be to you know support the maintenance long term of a of a, a data bank for. Uh, you know, barcoding like the Smithsonian is doing, but we can, we, I mean, I think we certainly can and appreciate your suggesting it uh, a sort of in a, in a way that's really efficient, contribute to that. Just one more thing. The reason why this is also important, I mean, eDNA, even if you don't know what it, what it is, you can't match it to something, it will still tell you something about the diversity in the system. But I think this is also, or these are systems where there is a very high um, potential of new species and new things species. like this. So you don't want to miss that opportunity. Right. Either. Hi, Les Kaufman, Boston University. Um, I remembered. Oh yeah, um, I'm Bill Brown, excuse me. <laughs> uh, along those same lines though, um, we're experiencing a massive accumulation of sequence data in the absence of systematists. And it would be really important not just to take pieces of organisms, but to take organisms and have people supported who actually studied them as organisms, not as nucleic acid. Um, and this is an enormous opportunity but we have to make sure that the people are there to do the work. So let, let, let me, let, I was just, I mean, you're, you're preaching to my heart and my past experience <laughs> as a museum director and yeah. But, uh, so every, so what Les said is clearly correct. But again, you have to realize our, our, our budget is limited. So there's, we can hire people and, we can do, uh, we can, you know, we can use the studies program to support people who are systematists, but they're, but we're, it's kind of limited. Well, it's yeah. also a dwindling pool. It's a dwindling pool. Yeah. There, there was a, also some chat comments uh, that there seems to be quite a bit of ongoing work with the Smithsonian. So that's a great, and the USGS. great pathway. Yeah. 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 We all noted, we, we, uh, we've been long supporting, uh, Actually, the maintenance of a collection of, of uh, organisms from deep in the sea. They are principally worms of one kind or the other, but some of them are very attractive worms. Right. And uh, and then we're linking that to the, you know, the 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 frozen collection and uh, and and uh, barcoding work. Yeah. Sure, and, 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 oh, yeah sorry, this is Rodney. Can I just add to that just for a second? Yeah, you know, we uh, we have been working with the Smithsonian Natural History Museum for some time. There was a a biodiversity summit not that long ago at the Natural History Museum as well. And I really think that, you know, uh, they're expanding their freezers collections, they're taking all these samples, they're adding more staff, they're doing more sequencing. Uh, you know, it's NOAA, it's BOEM, it's USGS, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's other agencies, Navy was involved as well. I think people really understand the importance of this and what it can lead to. And uh, from what I understand, uh, our long-term 40 year relationship with the invertebrate group there, uh, is, it will, will continue to grow and expand. I think they're in agreement as we are too. Thanks. Okay. And, and there's but, at least one cute organism down there. Yeah. Karen, and Sea please. cucumber. <laughs> Karen Ashton, um, eDNA is great for diversity, but we can't forget that you have to ask the right question because it doesn't tell you anything about abundance. And so you're not gonna know how many are there. It also doesn't tell you what life stage they are. So if you have an area that's being recolonized, you might expect earlier life forms stages. You, if, you're, if it's actively being recolonized or maybe you're getting the, um, what's it called? The, uh, the larvae in the water rather than the sessile form from the eDNA, you're not gonna know that by just looking at eDNA. And so you could be looking at an area that has just a few of the same diversity of organisms that you had in the past and it isn't recovering, or you could be looking at an area that is recovering. So you need more, more than just eDNA. It complements other approaches and you have to ask the right questions. It is not the God's gift to, the, to everything. So don't forget that. Hey, so 
I just want to point out when we're looking at nodules on the deep seabed. Um, okay, so we don't have much money to do that with. Uh, we need to be fairly close in order to see them on geophysical data. So one of the things I am trying to incorporate into our work related to that is always to gather imagery, uh, video footage, because if you're running an AUV along the seabed, uh, doing G and G five meters up, it isn't that hard to strap a GoPro or a more expensive GoPro that can work three miles deep um, to gather geo reference data that you can then use for for some of that taxonomic uh, work. I, I understand for it's just large, a, a little piece. The large things and not for the info, anything in the sediment. So right, you're just right. seeing stuff that's sitting on the surface and there's probably a limit to how small a thing you're going to be able to see. And so, you know, the diversity in the deep sea is much greater than just the macrofauna. I, I was uh, struck by the, uh, um, you know, when you were when you were talking about the nodules and the, and the the harvesting that was done back in the nineteen seventies, and that you can still see the line there. So earlier in the meeting, we 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 talked about the uh, environmental impact, um, and in the in the near shore and in the sand where it seemed to be. Uh, very, very limited in time, you know, through three or four months, and it was backwards. Here, you're dealing with completely the opposite problem, and you've got something that's lasting 50 or 60, 60 years. So it's, it's going to take, you know, right within your, your kind of group, it's going to take two completely different ways of looking at the environmental impact. Right. And I mean, deep sea mining, right, or nodule recovery. You're mining. I mean, it, that is the impact, right? There's there's no way around it. You're removing the nodules, um, so you're altering the habitat. Those nodules, those tracks are going to be there pretty much permanently, because nodules take millions of years to reform. And right now, USGS is you know studying uh, growth or, and and others are studying the growth rates of the nodules, specifically out at Blake. There's a lot of good paleoclimactic information in those slowly accreting layers. Uh, that tell you about the you know ancient climate regimes things like that but yeah there's no way around the the fact that you're removing uh, a hard substrate from the seabed you know we're aware of that so from an agency perspective one of the you know one of the uh, areas we need to look at is what what can we do to mitigate that you can't remove the nodule um, you can't not remove the nodule if you're trying to remove the nodule right it's so do we replace it with something? Do we have set aside areas? Do we only allow every other nodule to be picked up using some of these lower impact methods? Um, that sort of thing. And what's the, what's the impact? And that's part of what this Blake Plateau study will look at is the biodiversity, the infauna, the, the benthic forams, all that sort of thing within the tracks and adjacent little piles along the tracks versus the areas outside of the mined area. Uh, is there really a difference? Uh, well, obviously there will be, but what is that difference and how can that be mitigated or managed, you know, responsibly? So. Yeah, Dan Cost again. You guys have a, I mean, I'm thinking about the role of, of passive acoustics in some, of some of these areas that you know you're going to be looking at for a period of time and you guys have a acoustics center has that been put into this? You, I assume you're already thinking about that. Probably want me to answer that, or, <laughs> but you can if you want to. Well, yes, please. I, the, I, the, the answer is, I think, no at this point, uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Actually, I'd like to hear more. Uh, and and uh, But we, you know, we've, uh, uh, we focused heavily on, uh, uh, originally sort of seismic survey type issues for oil and gas. And now almost all the focus is on offshore wind, which is taking up everyone's time right now. But, you know, the concept is, can I ask you, so what do you think, what do you think we should look for? Well, passive, I mean, both, I mean, the soundscape is an important baseline. And you mentioned that some of these mechanisms are going to be noisier than others. So it's the added noise to the environment, but it's also the, the soundscapes tell you a lot about what's there, at least what's making noise. And so 
obviously it has to be things that are making noise for you to hear them, but there are a lot of things that, uh, that are, uh, the beak, I mean, a lot of the deep diving whales are making noise, they're using biosonar, which is challenging because it's high frequency, which means that you need a lot of bandwidth to, to, to bring in to archive those data. The, the other thing that's interesting is that there has been an initiative to instrument deep sea cables, the telecommunication cables with acoustic receivers. With, you know, the idea is it wouldn't take that much more effort since you're already laying these cables to put these sensors out. And if that happens, I don't know the status of that, but that would give a tremendous ability to take in sounds, uh, soundscapes of the deep ocean because those things, as you know, are going everywhere. Uh, it would also be a tremendous amount of data coming through that would you'd need automated systems to to characterize. But you know, there's fish that makes noise. There's there's I doubt that there's dawn and dusk choruses in the deep ocean. But you know, I, I, there are there might be some sort of patterning to the acoustic environment. And and I don't even know what's how much has been done in the deep ocean for these acoustics. Um, I'll point out, we did purchase uh, a couple shallow water hydrophones recently um, that we plan to deploy on most of the upcoming work, but just on a very limited surface basis, just under the concept of if we're on the ship, what can we bring? Well, if we can't bring anything else, we can bring a couple hydrophones and at least gather some data in a really remote area that no one else is going to. I don't know how useful the data will be. I'm not an acoustician, but I imagine something's better than nothing. Uh, you know, we can't strap it to an ROV going down 6,000 meters. It's kind of out of our budget. Uh, those tend to cost more. Uh, Lori? Oh, it's sorry. probably easy to collect the data. It's, it's another thing to analyze it. <laughs> and it takes some fairly sophisticated approaches to actually work with the data sets because they're large and it's, and it's, it also depends on what you're looking for, but getting it's the first step. Yeah, ultimately, I think we'd want to work with partners on that or or the CMA. Just quickly, because I but it's a follow up really. Um, uh, so I mean, it's very interesting. But I, I did mention it yesterday, but maybe to note we uh, and I, I'm sure Dan knows that we're very involved in uh, in a, an effort to deploy a, a whole grid on the in the Atlantic for passive passive acoustic monitoring that relates to offshore wind. And actually the Erica Statterman, who's our scientist, is leading it is she did her PhD on fish noise in the sea. Uh, so this would be music to her ears. And we are um, we have a, an alternative to a direct regulatory requirement of monitoring by the companies that we are developing and I'm optimistic we'll adopt where uh, where the companies will have have the option of contributing funds to our studies program, and then we would pool the funds with a, a, a sophisticated manager of the system to uh, deploy instruments and to make sure that. And, and so, instead of having a patchwork of just some hydrophones on leases that less leases uh, establish, we could have a uh, not a deep sea. Uh, array, but an array, a very large array that really would have us understand things broadly there. And uh, the quick answer probably is that uh, uh, that's so much further ahead in terms of development that, yeah. And I think uh, uh, Lori and then Deb. Hi, this is Lori Suma. I just have a quick question about lithium. Uh, you mentioned lithium brines at the seafloor, but there's a tremendous amount of commercial interest onshore in subsurface lithium brines. And I just wonder if you expect that activity to ramp up offshore and whether you need to be involved in assessment of those offshore subsurface brines. That was one of the, uh, the spurs for the salt brines project uh, in deep water that we're talking about was, you know, Argentina uh, basically filters uh, salt brine rich water uh, through a set of filters to pull the lithium out, right? It's a lot like remediating a gas station for petroleum, same concepts. Um, so what we're focused, what I'm focused on with this particular project, uh, which is managed out of the Gulf uh, for salt brines is 
just assessing what the composition of the salt brine is. Uh, there's so little information on that. Uh, it, it's kind of an oversight. Uh, people measure the salinity, but they don't actually measure what's in the salt. It's more than just sodium and chloride. Uh, in the Gulf, those salts, uh, forgive me, I'm not an oil and gas geologist, but I think those salts are tied to the Luan salt layer, which, you know, form some of those salt domes for the, the oil reserves, things like that. So there's likely to be more than just salt and chloride in the water or in that, in that brine. Um, some of these pools are quite deep uh, and, you know, extensive on the surface. So there could be a significant volume uh, of, for example, lithium in there uh, because they aren't really biologically rich as, as far as I'm aware of. Uh, you know, it's a very, very high salt environment. If a method could be developed of pumping, this, pumping the water up, removing the salt, the lithium, and pumping the rest of the salty water back down, um, well, that, that seems like a relatively low impact uh, method of recovering salt mines. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was thinking about the um, the, the subsurface brines as well, um, but characterizing the seafloor brines is a, certainly a, a good first step to understanding the subsurface brine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm aware of you know lithium brines like out in Nevada and places like that, but you know it's definitely outside of Bohm's authority. So. Uh, Hey, please. But we keep track of that uh, because there's, you know, we have to look at terrestrial uh, analogs and also from an environmental aspect, it's, you know, you need that for that cost benefit, uh, terrestrial mining versus activities on the deep sea. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Oh, sorry. Sure. sorry. Deb Glicks and National Academies. Um, so going back to a, a comment that Dan made about data collection versus data analysis. There's a tremendous amount of video taken near hydrothermal vents and on the abyssal seafloor um, from things like Alvin for the last 40 years, much of which has never really been analyzed for anything other than the specific use that it was there for at that time, You know, looking at a specific thing. Is there any way to think about working with other agencies to try to analyze some of that old data that's probably archived and not being used? I think that's definitely worthwhile. Uh, a few years ago, I was at USGS and we were looking at video footage from, I forget the name of the pipeline, but it was a pipeline from Louisiana across the West Florida shelf into Tampa Bay. Uh, and basically that was, you know, sitting there with videotapes and documenting the organisms you saw uh, foot by foot along, along the video transect. Uh, so there's definitely value in that. Of course, it's expensive, but with, you know, and, and Bohm's role might not be to, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm being hypothetical here, but maybe our approach better might be to fund research into ways to automate that process. You don't need a bunch of grad students staring at a video screen documenting tube worms. Um, that could be done with you know, machine learning algorithms, things like that. I, I tend to, I, I always think you need grad students staring at it. <laughs> yeah, so well, maybe a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, follow, um, Dan yeah. Costigan, Ambari has made a lot of progress in that area. I mean, for years, they it was amazing. They would visually, they'd have people scan their videos from the ROVs. There's a couple of folks that are developing some very sophisticated, sophisticated AI methods of looking at deep sea benthic critters and, and automatically identifying them. And at the very least, calling them out that says you should look at this. But to have my last... Uh, they just gave a presentation a month or so ago that I was at, and it was quite amazing how far that technology and how far it's advanced. And, and, and I'm pretty sure the Ambari folks are on the leading edge of that. I think we have Drew Remsen in our environmental program. I think he used to work on that sort of uh, flow through rapid machine learning pattern recognition stuff too. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's of interest to us, but $2 million, right? So like, how do we spend the money best? Last yeah, and, and we're we're doing a, using a object identification AI for uh, from uh, looking at images from uh, birds and marine mammals. Tim White is doing it, uh, and and um, 
I, I had the same reaction that that uh, this could be an interesting AI type question. You know. You... So we're almost out of time. Let, let's Do you want me to go, go or shut more? up? Or... No, no, go ahead. One okay, <laughs> um, a couple of quickies. One, Paul. Um, uh, I'm naive about this, but what's the story with methyl clathrates? And is there any danger of disturbing them or releasing carbon in the process of deep sea mining? And then I have another question after that quickly. So I don't know. Okay, I don't know. That's as simple as I, I know what they are. Uh, yeah. And I know the, you know the danger of disturbing them and the methane release, um, creating explosions, all that sort of thing. But honestly, I, I don't know what the intersection is between uh, nodules specifically and methyl clathrates. Yeah, it's like if they, they occur in the same areas, that sort of thing. But that might be a hazard that we would need to mm -hmm. you know, map out uh, as part of leasing stipulations. And, and the other thing is just a quick recommendation. Um, in order to fully understand the significance of biodiversity in the nodule fields, it might be good to encourage uh, people doing studies to sidle up onto island slopes and seamounts because we really don't know what's going on there or what the general context of biodiversity is. We've been, I'm peripherally involved in exploring uh, Kiribati and we, we keep finding new things on the island slope that extend onto the abyssal plain. Uh, last, last comment to- But oh, Laurie was, oh, okay. This is actually a little outside, but I thought I would share it that on CNN this morning, I was reading a new article that was um, basically the title is Deep Sea Expedition Capture Stunning Images of Breaches in the Pacific Mining Zone. And it is in the, um, now uh, the Clarion Clipperton Zone. And it's, um, they just found a bunch of things. I mean, actually, you always do. And so this whole idea of mining versus biodiversity and everything, I just wanted to alert people that there's a new paper or a new article out. Thank you. I think with that, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up. But thank you, everyone. It's been a great, great meeting. I, I, I did a calculation. It seems like there's, for your, your program, there's $1 for every 1,280 acres. Is that? Yeah, I think it's like a tenth of a really cent. Tenth of a cent per acre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that definitely could use a little more funds, given how critical critical minerals are and stuff. So, but uh, uh, before we break, I, look, thank you everyone for their 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 participation, their open and honest uh, uh, conversations. I'd, I'd like to particularly thank the National Academy of Science staff, uh, Jonathan, Zoe, Deb, uh, Caroline, online for for supporting us and uh, giving us such a great meeting and. Uh, uh, it was just a pleasure, and so we'll we'll see you later later this afternoon for hopefully a, a conversation, a beverage, and some food, eh? And uh, with that, I, I guess we'll break for lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>